Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Friday, September 16th. Time for an episode of Trucking Technology and Efficiency. Joining me today is John Walco. I believe Joel can't make it today, so John and I are going to run the show. I've got uh, some odds and ends we'll get to. We'll see what John's got today. Calls are already starting to come in, so we should probably jump right in and get started here. A couple things real quick, and then I'll bring John in. Um, I see that the FMCSA is looking at a proposal to change the exemptions around the ELDs uh, with older engines. There was never really a reason that they exempted the older engines. There was plenty of technology we could have used. Uh, For whatever reason, they decided to exempt those. And I know people who sold trucks and went out and bought them to get that exemption. It's probably going to go away. If they say they're looking at it, it's probably going to go away. And there's really no reason to keep it. Just get rid of it. Move to the ELDs. Be done with it. You had your break for, what did you get, four or five years almost of an exemption? It's time. So that's that's probably going to go away. The, um, the other thing I want to talk about just for a second, uh, the economy. So up until now, unless you were really digging, if you were just watching mainstream media and social media, yeah, you heard we're kind of sort of in a recession. Things aren't looking that great. But it, it, I don't think anybody was really saying how bad some of these numbers are. And they really are. FedEx came out today with a, a an updated earnings estimate, and the market is crashing over it. Uh, FedEx expects to have significant lower earnings for the next couple of years, they're saying, uh, at least into 2023. Uh, that's just not a good sign. Um, the stock market runs on earnings. That's why it doesn't always reflect what's happening right now in the economy. We're just starting to get earnings. Earnings are a lagging indicator. They take a while. So by the time you start seeing the earnings dropping, the market will follow. That's what we're in for. We had a big drop uh, this week. Looks like it's down again today. And I don't think the earnings for most companies are going to hold up much longer. And that's when things will really start to tank. We've been watching the stock market kind of bounce along and then it recovers and we call those dead cat bounces. It's not going anywhere except down. Now, real quick, um, we've already got calls coming in. Things are going on. Um, I will probably do a more in-depth open about this topic. But right now, I just want to give you some optimistic news. I don't want to be the guy that comes on here every day and say that says the economy sucks. We're in for a tough time. We are. You have to be realistic. You have to face that. But we can also turn this into a really big positive, And I believe that. I've done it before. I'm looking forward to doing it this time as well. You know, when the economy is hot and the market is cranking and there's money to be made, and that's been the case for quite a while now, you go chase the money. There's nothing wrong with that. If if all you can do is get out there and get the revenue and, you know, you just keep chasing that, that's fine. If you have time during times like that and you can control some expenses, you should. But sometimes you just go after the revenue. It's not a bad way to do things when the market is nice and hot. Rates are good. That's over. That party is over. We're in for a tough time. How tough, how long, we don't know yet. I tend to try to prepare for the worst during a time like this and then hope for the best. So I don't know what more you can do than that, than prepare for the worst, which I think we have, both business and personally, and then hope that it's not that bad. But if it is, you'll be all right. Here's where we can turn this slow economy that that I think we've got a couple of years of, at least 18 months, 
And I, I think that's a minimum. But the way you can turn that into a positive is you start working on you during this time. Sharpen the saw. Remember the book, The Seven Habits. That'd be a great place to start. Now you have time to read. Not that truck drivers ever had an excuse not to read. I don't care how busy you are. The more you drive during a really, really busy economy, the more you could have been learning. But a lot of people don't. Now's the time. Sharpen the saw. Work on you. And like I say, I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to do a bigger show on that. But um, right now, I think we're just going to jump in, bring in John, see what's on his mind this week. Um, then we'll get to calls. They're starting to come in. Uh, all right. Yeah, I'm not going to jump into that topic because it'll take me a while. So, John, good morning. Happy Friday. Welcome back. <laughs> Happy Friday to you, too. What's on your so, mind today? Glad to be back. Um, I'm, I'm still coming down from my week I had in California last week. I was uh, Things just went really well there. That's awesome. So it was uh, it's like, we, you know, we, we talked about that 25-year overnight success story yeah, thing. That's and right. it's, it's really... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like pinching myself. I, uh, I, I've, uh, after, after our performance last week, I mean, we set fastest laps in three races. We won two of the four races. We had cars at the front in each category we had cars in. And it was all the stuff that was under my tent. It was all the stuff I was engineering. So, uh, it was, it was really cool. Uh, it, it was a whole lot of fun. And, uh, I've been invited to, uh, do a factory tour when I go to Italy next month. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get to go see the Ferrari factory oh, and the race cool. team and everything over there. And it, it's really, really cool. Yeah. 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 So it's, uh, so I'm still kind of working through that. And, you know, I, I'm listening to you about the economy and, and I, I've got concerns too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I'm not seeing it yet. Like I, I deal with, people that are just, just over the top wealthy and right. they're spending money like drunk sailors right now. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what's, what spurred it on or what happened. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's COVID anymore. We've gotten over that. Oh yeah. yeah I think that little bump that we had from, uh, yeah. You, you so know what I uh, kind of see this time <laughs> really is that we had this really, really long run in the economy. I mean, think about it. Really, we haven't had a bad economy since '09. We had a couple little pullbacks that, you know, a couple of years where it got a little slower, but nothing. Yeah. So since the subprime thing, things things have gone steadily forward since the subprime thing happened. Yeah, they, they, and, they have. You and, know, it's been you know, growth has maybe been slower than some people like, but it was steady. You know, I didn't mind when it was slow and steady, and, I and didn't now either. it's you know a lot right. of. Yeah, I, I think that that made a lot of sense to me. But it's the but, longest economic yeah, expansion crazy. in history. We don't even know what to expect yeah. because we've never really seen anything like this. And I think that's what you're seeing. The rich really did get a lot richer during this time. They really did. <laughs> right. It, it's, it's, yeah. And the numbers are staggering that we now commonly refer to billionaires. Yeah. Right. That that's like. Yeah. I mean, I was nobody hang, talks I, I, I about billionaires anymore. No, it's a billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nobody talks about millionaires. Why would you? That, oh, that guy's a billionaire. Who cares? Right. <laughs> Who cares? So what? Him and a you know a million other people, but the billionaires now. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it is kind of crazy that. <laughs> Some of these people will be shielded from the worst economy ever. It just won't matter to them. They can continue well, to the spend way money like crazy. Things, well, and the way their investments and such are, are worked out, they 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 can't spend enough. It seems it, that's like, what like I they, mean. They, they, they yeah. just, you know, they're, they're they're like this perpetual motion machine that uh, doesn't, you know, that we'd like to, you yeah. know, <laughs> economically, they're, they're like that generator that runs off the motor. Right. It, it does. I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just, you so, know, I, but, I, you know, I, I, need, I need more of that. You know, so, so to me, you know, it, it, we, we've gone into, you know, we've got the, the wealthy or the big corporations or whatever, and the rest of us are in service industries, right? So I, I'm their race car boy. I could be like their boat boy or their pool That's boy right. or their whatever. <laughs> right. and, and so, so, so it, it doesn't matter, but I, I'm, I'm the one who looks after their, 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 their race car, at least. 
uh, helps the guys look at the guys look after it. But it's uh, and that, that's what we are. That's where we are. So you know, the truckers, are, we're a service industry. You know, we're we're that we've gone to you know big mega corporations and wealthy wealthy people who've made huge wealth off of those, and the rest of us serve it. And we owe it to ourselves to charge as much as we can for that. Yes, so, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Works. That's yeah. That's what you know. That's what we talk about here. Improve. Now we don't just say raise your price. You you can't. I mean that the market doesn't no, no. allow that. What we talk about is how you improve yourself, your service, your value. When you bring more value, people are willing to pay more money. Precisely. You could demand a premium then, right? You, right? you provide a better service than the other guys. You, you're you the one who, you know, I, I'm lucky in a, in a place where I could show results on a weekly basis. That could go the other way, too. Someone could come start kicking my ass. I'm done. <laughs> right. But it's, it, but at least, you know, I, I've got that, you know, I've got that uh, verification every week or what, every time we go to the track or do whatever. And, you know, you get to say, okay, that stuff's winning still and we need that guy. And all of a sudden people start throwing money at you. So you know, on, on your end or on our end, our, our, our listeners end, I mean, provide a better service, work on your stuff, make, you know, don't show up with a dirty truck. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe there's no, stuff it, like that that you need to, you, you need to do. Especially so, yeah. the trailer, the inside of the trailer. You know, a lot of times the shipper, they may not even see your truck. If they're not walking outside, it, it, you should still keep it clean. It should look good. No doubt. But the trailer come on guys sweep out your trailer before you back into a dock you know it's just simple exactly. stuff but you you've kind of played into what my open was potentially going to be um so i'm gonna bring it up and see what you think I, you know over the last okay. couple of years i've been kind of watching what's going on with you and your life my my open today was going to be i kind of touched on it that you know, it's wonderful when there's money and all we have to do is go after the money. You know, it's out there. It's everywhere. The economy's booming. All you have to do is go grab the money. You don't really even have to be all that good at anything. You just have to go work. You know, just go work. There's plenty of money out there. But a lot of times, and it happens with me and, and our business and me personally, when you're chasing that kind of a hot market, you know, you're working a lot. We were putting in a lot of time chasing that. And we weren't always improving ourselves in the business during that time. Because you, sometimes you just don't have time. When you do finally quit working, the last thing you want to do is work on yourself or the business. You go take a break. You go have some fun. I, I actually look forward to these downturns in the economy. I never used to. But I got to the point, you know, I've been through enough of them now that if you prepare for them, you know they're coming, you get prepared. It's kind of a break in, you know, that crazy, hectic, you know, chase the dollar the whole time. And I feel like I can kind of breathe and slow down and work on myself again. And, I, and that's really the lesson that I have for people right now. There's not a whole lot you can do about what's going on. We, we're having a hard time even predicting it. We can't affect it. The government can't even change it at this point. Um, it's going to happen. So take advantage of it. Work on yourself. And there's this concept, this idea of uh, uh, habits. You know, our habits are what dictate our outcome. And, and we are creatures of habit, whether you believe it or not. Almost everything we do all day long is driven by habit. So if you can find your habits that aren't working and change them and create habits that do work, that's how you can improve things. And now is the time to start working on that. This idea, though, that there is, when you look at all of your habits and the ones you want to change, there's, there's the idea of a keystone habit, that there are certain things you can change in your life that tend to drive other positive changes in your life as well. Like you tend to get compound benefits when you change in this particular area. Um, you know, I'll take an example of something that isn't necessarily a keystone habit. I'm not really organized. I never have been. I try occasionally to get organized because I think it's probably important and maybe I'd be a little more effective. if It never works. It's just one of those personality things. I'm just not organized. And I will spend days trying to organize something. And a week later, it's a mess again. 
So after a while, I figure, why do I keep spending that energy? It's not doing me any good. That Those kind of habits, sure, they can have some positive benefits, but not a lot, really. But there are things in our life, and, and I'm kind of leading up to your changes over the last couple of years, that when you make a change in one of these keystone areas or habits, a lot of other things get better. Does that sound familiar for you? Oh, absolutely. That, uh, you know, there was a transition, you know, when I, when I went to work at Pittsburgh Power there in 2015, I, I'd come off, I, I, I've had some serious struggles financially. Like, I, I'm still not out of the woods by any, any means. And, I've, you know, I've explained my philosophy to you about, no, I, I set a standard of life for yeah. me and my kids and I'll figure out a way to pay for it. Right. Uh, so there were some rough years there, especially around the, you know, the, uh, you just talked about the, you know, the subprime crash. Um, you know, we were doing okay before that. Uh, o two to, you know, from O two to O eight O nine. I think I let my last employee go. I got down to myself at the shop in O nine. Um, that was one of the first big changes because up to that point, I had anywhere from six to to twelve employees. Yeah. Um, four or five full time year round. Uh, numerous fly ins. You know, numerous subcontractors over those years. So uh, had a pretty nice little gig going. I mean, we. Again, it was a service business then too. We had uh, three or four cars that we looked after here and got to the track, and they were for wealthy families, shall we say, of young drivers who wanted to be up and coming indie car drivers, which was the world that I was in. They were it was uh, for that. So we had a nice little business going, and my wife looked after the bookwork and all the logistics for the team, and bought all the plane tickets and took care of everything and did a fantastic job. And it all kind of came crashing down. Well, it, it came crashing down about a year before I, I realized it did. Right, I, right. I kept people on for for, for an yeah. extra year, and I, my optimism was I was going to sign people at, at the right number, and we're going to make money, and uh, put myself in a pretty big hole, keeping employees on a year or so longer than I should have, and so forth, and got myself into a bit of a bind. And I've been digging out from it ever since, to be honest with you. Uh, so got down to myself here at the shop, started doing a little restoration work, some vintage work, took a complete change of direction and, and managed to pay the bills. It was a struggle, but I managed to pay the bills. And that led the whole way till 2015 when I started dabbling in some pro racing again. I had a guy hire me to uh, basically run a team for him. His cars lived at my shop and, you know, I hired the truck driver and we rented, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a tractor at the time. So I was using Penske's. And, um, my, you know, my old truckie, you know, he came back and helped out and, you know, I was covering those bills and billing him. Well, he stuck me with a really big bill at the end of 2015 and there was no point in fighting it. I wasn't going to, you know, right. we, we were on a handshake. We didn't have a solid yes. contract. And I, I really kind of got screwed. And again, I, I didn't have a lot to, to lose. I mean, I was, yeah, right. I was already running really lean and then, and then that happened and, you know, Bruce called me out of the blue to talk about what kind of car he was going to buy. And next thing you know, I was going to work for him and he told me I was going to. You know, the quote was, how would you like to be sitting at my desk in two years, which was never right. going to happen. I, I didn't know that at the time. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, hey, yeah, he, that, that's he a whole offered other me story, his but. office, too. <laughs> yeah, you got to use it. Well, he's never there. I know. So that's yeah. probably, probably, you know, it yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't be hard. Uh, but yeah, so and again, that was that was interesting to see that I could go get a job again and, and do that. And, you know, as try as I might to run that shop like a race shop, it, it really, it, it was a different mentality than I'm used to. Uh, I've been self-employed for so long and just do the whatever it takes thing that sometimes right. struggled for me to, uh, you know, see a guy clean up his tools at three thirty or three fifteen or whatever it was, knowing that there was only like an hour's worth of work on that truck to get it done. And I wasn't allowed to give him overtime. I'm right. like, that is ridiculous. It, I right. mean, this, this thing could be going down the road in an hour. The test drive could be done. This guy could save a hotel room and get his truck back to work tomorrow. And this guy's going to put his tools away and go home. Like, it was just weird to me. I mean, I'm someone who like, you know, at the track, if we crashed the car in the last session, it's got to be on track in the morning. You'll be up until three in the fixed. morning, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just getting doesn't done. Doesn't matter, yeah. Right. yeah. It completely doesn't matter. Yeah, and that's that's how I roll. So, so, but now I've melded the two, right? So, I, you know, was out there in the real world for a while, and you know, not just on my own. And now I'm back to being on my own and taking some of the lessons that I've learned from that and so forth, and uh, moving forward. And yeah, I've changed some habits. You know, I. I start a lot earlier than I used to. I did. There are some things that, uh, you know, I, I struggle with organization thing as well, but, uh, it's really odd. I'm kind of got a yin and the yang there. My desk is a mess, but I, <laughs> I have complete OCD about wiring on a car. Like, like right. I, I, you right. know, I, I won't let, right. <laughs> so, 
so it, it's paralyzing sometimes. So I'll do and redo things until it looks the way I want it to. And yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've come to embrace that stuff. It's taken years and years and years. And, uh, you know, the, the changes I've gone through and the respect that I've earned out there in the world, it, it, that's, that's really not easy to come by. You know, I, I didn't realize how hard it was to come by, you know, even after winning five or six national championships and all the things that I've done, you know, you really need to stick it out and be there for a long time to get, yes. you know, the real respect that demands the the, the money. And I, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that until now. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I get it you now. Know, there's a there's you know, a really good book about chip on my shoulder. And it, there's a really good book about that. One called? Have you are you familiar with Seth Godin? No, I'm not. Seth Godin is one of my favorite authors. I, I, am do, not. I don't talk about him much on the air. The reason I don't. His focus is primarily marketing. That, that's what he's done. That's what he's always okay. done. He's a brilliant marketer. He kind of, he was marketing on the internet before AOL was around. And I think he was actually a big part of AOL as a startup. I don't remember exactly what, what that was about, but been around doing this for a very okay. long time. His, his whole, if you wanted to kind of sum up his whole marketing, totally, t- completely different from what we think of when we think of marketing. His, and you'll recognize his model when you think about our business and, and what we do, but his whole philosophy was if you have 1,000, just 1,000, if you have 1,000 fanatics, you know, crazy, they just love what you do, that's all it takes to be successful. Build a thousand people who absolutely believe in what you do and everything else will take care of itself. And that's really what his whole philosophy is about, how you show up every day and you just slug it out and you build that value over time. You build the value where people absolutely trust that no matter what you do, bring a new product, a new service to market, that it's going to be done right. And that's, I mean, he's got dozens of books, but that's really what it always comes back to. So build that core group. And and my world is smaller than that. So exactly. so I I, I, I get the thousand. I I might not need that much. I mean, it's such a, such a tiny world that I roll in now. Right. uh, Yeah. But I, I, yeah, I totally get that philosophy. Yeah. You know, the, the idea that you have to go out and market to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, which is what traditional marketing is, um, this is the exact opposite. That and, and, you know, the good news was, and this is why he developed all these ideas, is because the Internet made this possible. Without the Internet, that wouldn't have been a thing ever. I, I, you know, maybe you might build something locally, but it was pretty difficult. The Internet changed all that gave you access to no matter how um, unique or narrow your topic might be with the internet, you can reach enough people that will be interested in it. No matter how out crazy out there it is with the internet, there's a thousand people in the world that would be interested in it. Oh, if, if, and if with the targeted marketing, you spend a little bit of money in, in the right SEO and it, it's, it, you know, there's data out there that you're not going to waste your time marketing to people who don't want you. Right. I mean, it's really simple nowadays. It's, it's amazing what technology has done and, you know, our phones that are listening to us and know where we are and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it, it, it blows me away. I mean, I, I love and hate it. Like I was, I, I don't know if I've told you the story before. I was in an airport once, just get back to the, the ability for targeted marketing. And I stopped and looked at some Thule backpacks at some kiosk in an airport. I forget where it was. I did not speak to a human being. I did not do a thing other than walk around this little stand a couple of times and look at a couple of these computer bag backpacks. Walked to my gate, opened my phone up, looked open Facebook, started scrolling. I immediately started getting ads for Thule backpacks. I didn't say a word. I, know, I did not say I a word. I didn't. It's, I didn't speak to a person. So it, it, it's even more than listening to. There's some sort of geo tracking, or I stepped into some geo fence or something, something that said that right. I was uh, standing around this pack for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Crazy yeah. Crazy technology. Yeah. But but so, yeah. So that so now if you take his philosophy there with the current tools, I mean it's it's. I don't want to say it's easy, but man, it's, you know, it's you should doable. be able to get right to the people yeah. you need to get to. It, it's yeah, not easy, it's but it's yeah. doable. You can look at it and go, no, wait, there's a system here. This works. I can, I can apply this to almost, like I said, almost any topic 
because you have the ability to reach enough people to support it now. And you have the ability to reach yep. those people really, really cheaply or even free if you just want to do the work. Right. Absolutely. Yep. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's an it's a interesting world we live in in that regard. And I think that's why you see so many successful little businesses. Now. I, 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 I think that it's given, I, given the tools to people who are clever enough and are willing to do the hard work, as you say, that, that, that you know, I don't care what it, it could be any business. I mean, you see all kinds of little stuff, little niches that are, that are thriving. And yeah. And again, to so, me, that's the new economy. It, it like, is. That's, and that's I, what it is. I like We're, it. I like it a lot. I'd much rather see so, this yeah, than little... nothing but big mega corporations doing everything. The, I want to yeah. go back. The, the book oh. by Seth Godin was called The Dip. And, and what he talks about is okay. how when we start a new project, we're excited. You know, you, you set out, you're excited. You've started a business or a new project or you've launched a new service, whatever it might be. You're excited. You're motivated. You know, you, you got all that startup stuff going on. And then if you get through that, and you actually start to get a little bit of traction, the, the next period gets really rough. It's what we call the dip. It's where now you just have to show up every day and do the work. You know, you might come up with this brilliant idea for a new whatever it is and say, look, I'm going to go market this. I'm going to use all these tools we just talked about. This is a system. It works. It, it works. But you got to do the work. And during the dip is when things really get tough. That excitement is gone. That motivation is gone. Now you just have to show up every day and prove your value over and over and over and over. Did I say over? And you just have to keep doing yeah. it every day. <laughs> and, and most people, people with brilliant ideas and great starts, they don't make it through the dip. Right. Uh, and that's, again, that's when they fail. Exactly. I, I'm even noticing it. It's kind of funny. The seven habits is on my desk. I, I haven't read it in probably eight or 10 years, but literally it's, it's, it sits on my desk under some pile of something here. I could see it from where I am right now. Uh, so but it, it's, you know, and you're bringing that up, but, but it's amazing how those habits, I don't know why I'm, I'm circling back to this, but, uh, you know, it's part of the dip though, or keeping getting yeah. through the dip is I'm finding that stuff that I really wasn't good about in the past when I was kind of struggling, you know, some of my note keeping, and again, like I said, it's organization issues, uh, is some of my pre-work before I'd go to a test or go to a, uh, you know, a race even, you know, there, there's work to be done ahead of time. I need to get set up sheets to the shop to put on the car. And there's, there, there's, you know, I'd kind of lack in that department as <laughs> I'm doing better. I'm, getting better at that stuff just right. because I don't want it to end. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. you know, when, when I, when I wasn't at the front end of things all the time and probably when I should have been keeping better notes and doing better, I was sort of flying by the seat of my pants and relying on instinct and so forth and just doing whatever. And I, I don't know that things would have happened quicker for me had I been handling things as I am now then or not. I, I think yeah. maybe, I don't think it made a shit of a difference personally, but maybe I'm making excuses for myself, it, but it, it but now I'm on it. Like right. I've got, you right. know, all my setup sheets are done for the cars before they asked for before they're asked for, I've got a test plan before the car hits the track. Sometime, you know, I, my, my philosophy always was, let's see what it does in the first session. We'll work from there. And now I've got, okay, I need to learn this, this, and this, and we're going to do these arrow changes in the first session. Then we're going to work through some mechanical stuff. Then we're going to go back to arrow. And, you know, so I, last test we did, I came up with a big plan. I sat the driver, the test driver and the mechanics down. I brought everybody in and said, okay, there's the, you know, have these tools ready. This is what we're going to do. You know, the car is going to go out. We're going to set a baseline. We're going to, if, if it's got a good balance on it, we're going to go to do, do this arrow testing right now. And then we've got these tires to test in the afternoon. So we're going to get our arrow work done. We're going to get our mechanical work done. We're going to get the car quick. And then we're going to do this tire testing. And the tire testing is going to go like this. We're going to have a control set. And we're going to have a, a, a candidate set. So the control set goes on. He goes out, sets a lap time. We put, you know, we put the candidate on and we go, you know, standard, you know, scientific process testing. Yep. And I didn't do shit. I, I didn't always do it like that before. I mean, I've <laughs> right. done that process, but right. more like by the seat of my pants. Yeah. So, you know, now I show up with it on paper and there's a flow chart and there's <laughs> everything. And yeah, so, but the, so, the habits thing, it's amazing how those evolve. Um, 
And, you know, again, I, I hate that things have to be going good for me to get good at that, but That's, yeah, I'm not motivated. When you they're know, not. I, I think it's human nature. I really do. I mean, it, you know, I feel the same way. Like, why do I get lazy like this? Why don't I do? I know I should. I, it, it, it's human nature. But what, what do you think? I think I know the answer. What do you think was the, the most important keystone habit that you changed that kind of set in motion all the other changes? Uh, some of the, exactly what I said there, the, the pre, the pre-work, the preparation, um, actually, actually preparing for my day or for my event, for my, whatever I, I would do very little, sure. I, I do wonderful mechanical preparation on the cars and such. Don't, don't get me wrong there. I mean, mentally pre- preparation so, that I just would. Yeah, so me, the Keystone habit, I, I think that I, I've developed over the past three or four years has been more of a, from a mental preparation standpoint. So let me ask you something, because I one of the things I want to do with this help other people identify what their keystone habit might be. What are some of the things you can change that kind of snowball into other changes? So did you consciously make that change first or had you started on the health thing first? Oh, it was the health thing first. Oh, honestly, the health thing is, is probably that's, the number one. That's that, the, that is the number one, number one. That's given me the ability to do these other, shall we say, I, I was, I was stick, stick going with strictly business there. Right, right. No, no, health is, you know, yes, sorry to bring that up. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, uh, that was number one, you know, just, just the, the mental clarity I have now that's that I don't a big part crap. of it. The, right. uh, the, you know, maybe that, maybe that's what's given this might, that might be everything. I'm like, you know, it, it's so natural to me now that maybe I, that, that's why I didn't think of it. But, uh, the health thing is probably number one is probably given me the sharpness to do the prep work. That is now my new habit that wasn't before. So yeah, that's definitely, yeah, there's, there's more to that than, uh, than, than I think I was, yeah, again, it's become somewhat natural exactly. to me, so I don't know. Right. You and know, that, I, I've been, I've been, I've been diagnosed with ADD, and I've been, you know, I, I've, I've been borderline depressed. I've been there, there's so many things as a kid. You know, I went through an ugly divorce with my parents. I, 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 they, I had IQ tests and psychological evaluations done on me when I was, you know, in tenth grade, and ninth grade, and eighth grade. I really struggled. I, I was, you know, my parents' divorce was like War of the Roses. It was disgusting. <laughs> it was. Uh, <laughs> and I was a young teen. And yeah, I stayed with my dad, which probably yeah, it was. It was. It was. I went, I've been been through a lot, and I, I think back now with the diet stuff it, and the way that I have an ability to focus that I hadn't before, and then after reading Grain Brain and much other stuff that that, that you know. I, Simply, I think that had my diet changed when I was a kid, I'd have got through all that stuff a whole lot, oh, a lot boy. better than I did. I, yeah, uh, I, it, to it, look it, back it, it, yeah. and, and so, think what, how much better things would be for all of us if our diet wouldn't have become so horrendous the way it is now. Uh, yeah. So one other lesson, and then I do want to get to uh, some calls. Um, a lesson I heard you mention earlier about your business. I've certainly gone through this. Um, I learned a lesson yesterday from my new sporting endeavor. And the lesson is, and this, this applies to business too. Now it's not always easy to figure out when the right time is, but if you keep this philosophy in mind, I learned this yesterday. When you see the crash coming, let go. Don't, there is a point where you should not try to save it anymore. Let go. You're you're, you're an old water skier. You should have known that. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I, so the, the board is dangerous. The, 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 that foil underneath the board, they call it the guillotine. And I, at first I'm wondering, why did they make it like this? First off, I wondered why the hell is it so expensive? Um, I just had to, I bought a new, I bought a new foil yesterday because mine is too big. The person who sold me the foil. Oh, okay, so so you're, did, 
didn't bother to you're ask just, me my wait weight. Wait a second, you're already on your second foil? I, you're, you're already I've, on your second one. I've had my wing repaired already. I already have a repair shop relationship <laughs> because I had to get my wing repaired. I tore it all up, and I had to buy a new foil already. And I've only been out three times. <laughs> and that that foil is it's twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, that's not no, no, that's, I've, that's I've not the board or anything. Told me about this, I've been the uh, yeah, I, I've been all over it. So I no. couldn't figure out why. Why is this so expensive? Well, they're all carbon fiber. Well, why are they carbon fiber then? Make mm-hmm. it out of something else. But now I understand why, <laughs> and I also understand why they're so razor sharp. The whole point of this thing is to cut drag to almost nothing in the water. Right. So in order to make these foils so crazy thin and still be strong enough, it has to be carbon fiber. These gotcha. things, these uh, things I'm, are I'm, like... I'm a fan of carbon fiber. I get it. Yeah, these things are like crazy thin. And you think of all the force that is against that foil. All it, The board doesn't touch the water anymore. All of your weight, everything you're doing is riding on that foil. And they're they're like an yep. eighth of an inch thick. They're so thin, it's crazy. <laughs> so to- isn't it fun? Uh, you, you, we you, we're on the same page about. So let, let, let me get 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 to something here. Just more philosophically, with you getting into the spoiling thing. I was looking at new skis on the internet this morning and stuff, and I, I'm kind of and it gets back to the health thing as well. I could I couldn't do this. I couldn't I wouldn't be thinking about some some killer new skis for this winter and, and spending some time out at the, at the Ferrari shop in Reno and and well actually more time up in the mountains uh, if it wasn't for the health thing and then really embracing being a crazy old man like <laughs> exactly. you're you're out there doing this shit with kids I guarantee it oh, they yeah. think you're nuts like oh, yeah. my kids think I'm nuts when they go skiing with me I'm like how do you still ski like that I'm like I don't know any other way to do it right so it, it's. It, it, having that ability and embracing, uh, you know, shall we say being a crazy old guy, you know, it's, it, it's, it's awesome. I, I'm having I like more it. fun now, like when <laughs> doing things and I'll ski off the shit that I shouldn't right yeah, tomorrow. Right. Like next time I go ski, it doesn't matter. I'm like, is it something steeper, something deeper, whatever. I'm, I'm going for it. I, I feel good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, 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 honestly, everyone says, oh, it hurts more when you crash, your joints hurt the next day. That's total bullshit. I feel great. Like, I really, I, I had more pain when I used to eat the standard American diet and I went skiing the next day oh, than I've no ever doubt. experienced now. No doubt. Yeah. And, and, I've and, been, and no, crashes don't hurt worse now at all. I, they, the crashes are crashes. They, they, they feel the same as they always did. So, yeah, yeah I, it, 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 it is what it is. All the listeners know I've been whining all week about how sore I am. I am sore. There's no doubt. But here's the difference. I go out there and you said, you know, there's a lot of young people. This sport is pretty well dominated by a lot of young people. There's no doubt. So I'm out there and I'm actually in Beginner's Bay. It's just got good conditions for kind of getting used to things before I go out onto the big river. So I'm kind of staying in the bay with with all the beginners. But I started noticing that during the time that I'm out there, everybody else that comes out, they come out and then they're gone. And I'm like, where did they go? They haven't figured this out yet. Why are they leaving? <laughs> and then another group comes in and they practice for an hour or two and then they're gone. And I'm like, where are they going? They haven't figured this out yet. Uh, it's, I've only been here five right, hours. Yeah. Why does everybody keep leaving? Well, I wonder why I'm sore. I do it till I can't even climb up on my board anymore. So yeah, I, I, I am hurting well, yeah, a little bit. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I, I would have never been able to do this, not even close. So, but here's I here's my lesson. Right. The one thing I figured out right away with that guillotine under there, I do not want to tangle with this board in a crash. That's a, you know that's what I kept thinking about. That I do not want to mess with this board in a crash. So the first time that I kind of got tangled up in the board. And it scared me a little bit. The good thing was it was, it was a very low speed crash. But the only reason I got tangled up in the board is because I tried to save it when I absolutely shouldn't have. In fact, the, the dismount is almost comical on this because the way to have a nice, easy crash with no real danger is just let go of your wing completely because that's where all the power is. If, if you let go of the right. wing, there's no more acceleration. So everything slows down. So let go of the wing and then just 
you just kind of fall backwards off your board. Just you just kind of let go and just fall, just, and just it, drop. it's just mm-hmm. the easiest way out of it. You're not going to get tangled up in your board. But I got thinking about your business when you said it had really died a year before. I just hadn't figured it out yet. It, we do that sometimes. <laughs> we just yeah. hang on too long. Hey, and I had an example. My, my dad went through a similar thing, but he, he kept people on for probably five years longer than he should have. And he wow. didn't even work. That's yet. a long time. It's uh, yeah. Well, he, we, we had a little manufacturing business. We built uh, vacuum trucks. I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you yeah. that, that history. Yeah, I remember that. So we built uh, truck mounted vacuums that what, what they were is not like a sore sucker, but it, it's, it's a dry vacuum. So it's got a nice filtration system on it, which is where I learned to build uh, my stuff about filtration. Right. And I designed and built those things for years. And he was a believer, man. He had a product finally. And, and my dad was always a salesman and he always wanted to be on the other side. He wanted to be manufacturer. He didn't want to be a sales rep anymore. Right. So we had this thing fall into our lap. A local contractor needed these vacuum trucks, and he knew my dad had history in vacuum, and my dad knew I knew diesel engines, and so we built the first truck in like 1989 or something, and it worked really well. It was a great design. It worked well. Uh, we got a patent on the on the filter system. We had you know thought things were going to go, and he believed it was going to go, and he was a believer. He's still a believer. He actually still sells the things, but he has a subcontractor who builds them. And he actually makes a little bit of money on them now when he does sell one. Not enough to cover the debt that he created, but <laughs> right. you know he's still uh, yeah, still at it. <laughs> but at least, but you know, at seventy four, seven, I don't know, he's actually seventy six. Uh, he's still at it. He still you know yeah. works every day. He's, yeah. you know, I'm su- I'm surprised he walked into my shop yet. But he uh, did that, and, and he didn't. That knowing to let go of the thing is is huge. I, I you know, I, I will never do that again. That's a, that was a, that was a good lesson. And like I said, I even had a poor example, you know. That, that I should have learned from and, and didn't. <laughs> so, yeah, right. you know, and the thing is, right. you become emotionally attached. It's your thing, right? You exactly. you become attached to. You you believe you you believe in your product. You believe in what you're doing. You believe you believe you believe. And I, I am optimistic to a fault. Right. You know, I I I think it's going to work until it doesn't. And you know, on skis, I'm pretty darn good at that second, third, fourth, and fifth effort. You know, when you're gonna, when you're going down you know, to, to save it. Right. But sometimes you don't, you know, and, and like on the airfoil, I imagine that's, 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 that's crazy. So, uh, the, uh, I, I try to snowboard every now and then and crashes on snowboards are instantaneous. There's not like a second or third, like, you, you, know, you know, if you catch an edge <laughs> I, on a ski, you just pick that foot I, up and, and you ride one for a little while and you get your bearings again. And, but on a snowboard, you just get flipped to the other side instantly. It's like, Holy shit, what happened there? I told and, that story yeah, yesterday. Which is probably, that oh, was really? that was a big learning thing for me. I the last I said the last physical skill like this I learned. You know, I, I and I, I kind of have a new goal right now. I don't I don't want to go another ten years before I learn a new physical skill like this. I want to stay active. I want to stay learning things like this. Um, I'm struggling with this more than I thought I would. I thought I'd be up, you know, on the foil all day. Uh, my best run right now on on the foil is about a hundred yards. I mean, that's where I am right now. I'm still not. Okay. And I'm on my third day. I'm struggling with this. I, and I think we're going to have good wind conditions today. I'll probably go out right after the show again. Um, but the last thing I learned was snowboarding. So we were at, um, oh, I don't know why I always forget the name of this pass. It's in southwest Colorado, down by Pagosa Springs. What's the big pass you go over before you get to Pagosa Springs? I don't know that one. Yeah, I, I always forget the uh, name I, of it. Yeah, I don't- Somebody will text me. Somebody will remember it. So we were okay. we so were going to we'll yeah we it. went to Pagosa Springs to hang out for the weekend and you know we did a snowmobile tour and um, Lisa one day says you know hey we passed that uh, ski area up at the pass why don't we go up there I'm like all right we didn't have any equipment we didn't have anything but you can rent everything you need so she decides she's going to ski and I said you know what I want to learn how to snowboard. Instead of skiing, I just, so I'll take a quick lesson and then, you know, off I'll go. So it was one of those days. I hadn't seen Lisa all day. I was pushing and pushing and pushing. And I had a couple bad crashes as I got tired and I said, I should quit. I'm done. I'm going to hurt myself. I always know I push too far. So I take one nice, easy run back down to the bottom. Who do I run in right at the bottom, getting ready to get on the lift, go up. Haven't seen her all day. Lisa, she's like, Let's take a run together. All right. 
I was like, I shouldn't do this. But I did, and I got turned around backwards and caught the edge, and my head slammed mm-hmm. off the ground so hard it knocked me out. I mean, it was a horrendous oh. crash. And you're right, it is milliseconds that it occurs. Yeah, you just get slammed to the ground yeah. like instantly. I, I'm like, so, and I, I, I've gotten okay on a snowboard. I still prefer skiing, but I, I can do it. I can get down the hill. And, you know, it was, it was not easy to learn. It was not and what I don't like about it. My ability to, to, you know, put in the second, third, fourth and fifth effort is like, that. I don't have that on the board. <laughs> right. So, right. And, and crashing a race car is the same way. You got numerous times you could, you could save it. Like, you know, or, you know, some motorcycle crashes too, because I've crashed everything. I, yeah, you know, if there's, you're not going to do what I do at the level I do it and not crash from time to time. <laughs> right. So it, it, it is, you know, even a motorcycle, I've been down on a street bike before and I've been close to being down on a street bike before. And it, it was, right. and you know, it was a sport bike and it was because I was pushing too hard. It wasn't anything stupid. It wasn't like someone backed out of a driveway in front yeah, of me. Right. Right. But I, uh, you know, I was a little, little too hot in a turn and got a little sideways and, and it bit and tossed me off the other side. But I, I you know, I gave it a couple of efforts before yeah. it happened. <laughs> you know? Remember so it was <laughs> remember the original nine hundred Kawasaki? I, I, I had I a good friend of mine had one he used to ride all the time and I bought the first one thousand. I had his EX ten right after the the, the, the original nine hundred ninja. Yeah. yeah, I had a nine hundred yep. in high school. I had okay. a 900 yep. Kawasaki in high school. One of the scariest things that I put that thing into a death wobble. <laughs> Holy cow, was that <laughs> this big, long, wide, sweeping turn. You know, this is, doesn't look like a dangerous turn at all. It's barely a bend in the road. But at 100 plus mm-hmm. miles an hour, that and you start to lean oh, yeah. in and it starts to stand up and you start to lean in and the whole bike is flexing. I mean, it's you can feel it, and it gets yep. into that. I thought I was going to die. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I had one of those once on my on my ZX10. It was it was it was it's it's scariest thing ever. Yeah, when it does that, the front tire bike. They say it's because of an imbalance in the force. So I'm like, I looked into some of what causes the old death wobble, and it's usually either either a loose triple clamp bearings, or the front forks don't have the exact same pressure side to side. That oh that yeah that makes sense. That was probably the case. Yeah. 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 Um, luckily, <laughs> luckily, bit. nobody was coming the other way because I needed all that room in the other lane to, to save it. To get it straight again. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. All right. What did so I, yeah, my ZX-10 did one of those going straight once. I was on the, I was on the, I was on the turnpike bridge there at Cheswick on PA Turnpike. I got on it hard and I kind of lifted the front and sat it back down. And when it sat back down, it, it, it got into this death wobble. Didn't sit right. And it was like, yeah. this, I had to, yeah, it didn't sit right. Yep. So yeah, scary stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. You and all I right, could, we can take calls or something we now should, or we just going to bullshit the whole time. We, we should, because you and I could do this all day long. Um, <laughs> you know, I do want to address the fact that the show is called Trucking Technology and Efficiency. And that kind of is the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the point. But we yeah. can talk big picture stuff, too. You know, we're right. Just we're so, big picture today. Uh, work, work. Well, the health relates to everything, so that we've got an excuse for that, right? That's right. So that 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 that's right. That goes to everything, and so we've got that. So the rest know, of it, Friday's, we can find some way to tie it in. Yeah, Friday's about life lessons, so we'll we'll take our our you know technology lessons and we'll turn them into life lessons. And if anybody has a technological <laughs> question, call. We'll answer it. So please, let's, yeah. yeah, we'll so, do our best to anyway. That's right. So let's get to some calls. Kim has been very patient. Kim, welcome. Hey, I just love the show. I listen to it usually overnight. This is when I, I drive. I just happen to be on a load today where it's uh, during the daytime. Well, good. good. And when you're used cool. to driving midnight shift and then the sun comes up. Oh, my gosh. It doesn't matter how much rest I had before. It's, oh, still, yeah. A little sleepy. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I Yeah. You know, you, you go through that, you know, if you're on truckload, you tend to get into patterns where you're either driving a day or night. And, you know, when it changes, if it changes, you usually have time to kind of adjust to it. But the worst time for me ever driving was um, when I had first moved my trucks down to the Orlando terminal and I didn't have any dedicated runs yet. 
So you just, we had what they called the extra board. So in the morning, there was a morning dispatch for the extra board. And in the evening, there was an overnight evening dispatch. And when things were really slow, and there were some really slow times back then, you just made yourself available for both. Because there were times where you might not work for a week. That you might show up every morning and there was just nothing. So then you say, all right, you know, put me on the night board too. And you just take whichever one happens to come up. But you got up early, you head to the terminal, you got to hang out, see if there anything happens. It doesn't, you go home, and then you're on the board at night. Then you're on a night run, and then the next thing you know, the day board picks up. So you, it was a mess. Trying to switch back and forth like that was awful. Yep, you're working both. Yeah. Okay, I guess when you're uh, open, you kind of threw me off in a tail now. I've got a 96 Freightliner FLD N14 13 speed. My questions were going to be uh, Air Dog, um, that other one, the Fast. And then fast, um, yeah. I've got wide singles, and all summer long I've had trailer tires, and I've gotten good mileage. Uh, 7.32 is my average. But now that you say that they're going after us paper log people, so okay, what kind of truck do I need to get? Well, let me I comment on Joel let, let, all the time. Hold, hold on, hold on, because okay. I, I may have a different okay. approach to this than you think. I, I still talk about older pre-emission trucks, late 90s, early 2000 trucks. I still have a soft spot for those trucks. I like them a lot. I know how to operate them. I know how to work on them. I know what to expect. There are no surprises. Um, maybe I won't ever get to a true 10 miles to the gallon, although Steve Crone's doing it. So it's, it's possible, even with the old technology. So the ELD thing changed. I always thought that was a horrible idea to choose a truck based on the ELD mandate anyway. Why not just keep the one you have? What's wrong with it? Were you really only keeping it so you didn't have to have an ELD? No, I like the old truck. What, just then, like then, you. Then just uh, because the, yeah, just because the ELD thing changes, why does that mean you have to change? Well, I'd like to get some of that 11, 12 miles to a gallon. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. All, all right. So if that's your well, goal, you that's, a reason, yeah. that's a reasonable goal. But to me, you know, when you started this, the, your are what you said was, you threw me for a loop, they're going to change the ELD, I need a new truck. So it sounds to me like it's the first time you've really thought about it, and you're only doing it because of the ELD. Well, so I would have talked you out of that. But if you do want to go build, you know, honestly, a 10 plus mile per gallon truck, then yeah, let's go do it. I would honestly rather have an electric truck. Well, you I just that's a few years down the road. Elon says he's going to sell yeah, you one this that's year. I, 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 yeah, I don't see that really happening. He's kind of running out of time this year. But uh, see, with with between sixty five and seventy two thousand dollars a year in fuel costs, dude, I can have well, an electric truck paid off in less than hey, four years. Hey, I'm going to go back uh, back well, a little bit, John. We were talking about, yep. I know you've, you've said you've been doing some research on the foil. The foil thing, by the way, have you noticed everything <laughs> you ride on the water now people are putting on foils? Surfers are using them on their surfboards. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Oh, my gosh. Have you seen the QE1 or two? Those sailboats are flying across the water. They're like four inches oh, off the water. They're a, just in there by the foil. On a like foil, right. The, yep. f the whole idea, this the foil, foil yeah. has like no drag. So you can actually ride this foil on just the wake of another boat. So you've got these guys now, the surfers, they, they put a foil on their surfboard and they carry a wing with them. One of the things they're starting to use it for is instead of getting towed out to the big waves and then towed into the big wave by a jet ski, they're starting to learn how to do it with the wing now. Just sail out with the wing. Right. Yeah. And then use the wing to get That's the speed cool. to race the big wave back in. Because you got to get ahead of those big waves and you got to match their speed. And they used to do it with a jet ski. Now they're actually doing it with the wing. So you see these guys out in the ocean on their surfboard. And instead of making a run into the beach and then having to paddle back out, they make a run into the beach. And all they do is if you just grab that wing by its front handle and like hold it over your shoulder. 
it just rides right behind you with no drag or anything. It just feathers out and just rides behind you. So they'll use the wing okay. instead of paddling out. And they finish a run. They don't even get off their board. They just pull, they just pull the wing back into position and it takes them right back out again. That's really clever. So I've seen some of these, some of these wake surfboards that they use a foil now too. I've seen just surfing along behind barges and stuff. It's, it's, it's really, really cool. You see here in Pittsburgh, there are a few of them out every now and then get a barge that goes up the river and they'll still, you'll see some people surfing the wake behind it. Well, when, when we're out on the river here, we have barges, lots of them. We have several big cruise ships that come through here, big cruise ships, um, we have three or four different companies. National Geographic runs a big scientific cruise here on the river that I'd like to take someday. But you'll see guys that are out there now with the foils, and they're out there with their wing or, you know, sometimes a kite. Or But a, a barge comes by, and just for the fun of it, you can just ride the wake and follow the barge. <laughs> yep. And you don't even <laughs> need so the cool. wing. It's like an endless wave. Yeah, you just you let yeah, the wing yeah, feather out behind you. And you get sucked in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so... I had another point to that whole story, and now I totally forgot what it was. Uh, it, it related to him wanting an electric truck. He got right back into the oh, foil that's somehow. It. I don't know yeah, if it's energy right. conservation or what. There, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. somebody now makes a motorized foil. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They're using an electric motor to make a motorized foil, so now you don't even need the wing. You just go jump on your foil, and you have a remote control in your hand. That's really cool. Yeah. That's what I like with skateboards. You see the skateboards, with, it's not even a remote control. You control it with your phone. It, right. You know, electric skateboard, right. and you have a little controller built into your phone. You use, like, the volumes button or something <laughs> to, to go. Yeah, Yeah, that's they have a, a, a motorized <laughs> foil now. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I need I need to get I I sorry I didn't I wanted to stay at some I had to get back to the shop I've got a project to finish up or I was thinking of staying on the West Coast for a little while, but with the Italy trip coming up and everything else I, I'm, I'm yeah. not, probably not going to get to visit you until the till early winter or late fall I think is when I'm back out there. Yeah, so. um, I maybe uh, certainly by early winter we'll probably be on the road actually. I got to start thinking about this. I have a uh, speaking engagement in Memphis in November. And I really, oh, cool. yeah, once we're on the road, I'm really thinking I want to stay for the winter. I just want to stay out once we, you know, we'll leave. I have Memphis and Nashville. I have two back to back. And then we'll probably head down to Florida and just stay in the south the rest of the winter. But the problem is I'm not, I'm not oh, cool. ready to leave. Uh, the coach still needs a lot of work. So... I'm hoping I don't have to leave and go do those two events and then come back and then leave again. So we'll see. All right, Kim, what else you got? I know that you didn't call just to bullshit yeah. with us about. Well, so let's back to, uh, you know, why would you oh, just not great. to me? I, I love the Mac. I, I know Joel's, you know, a Volvo now, but he, you know, he, he he's a, he's a, you know, he, he's a paid spokesman or something. Like that. <laughs> but, uh, it's just, I just, I just prefer the looks of the Mac to the Volvo. And if you look at what Jamie Hagen's doing, I think he's as or more impressive than, than anybody. You know, that, that guy, I've never met him in real life with Facebook friends and stuff, but if you follow him and the mileage that he's getting and his little fleet that he's building and the way he's growing that little business he's based doing. upon super efficient trucks. Yeah. I, I think he's a model that anybody needs to look at, whether it's one truck or six. And again, he's in that little sweet spot with, you know, He's growing slowly and he's doing it logically and he's doing it with trucks that I don't want to say are paying for themselves, but are giving him an advantage right. uh, that, are, that are efficient enough that he's, he's got himself ahead of way ahead of the game. So, you know, I'd See, be hard it. pressed I, to, I bought... to, to buy anything right. but a Mac or a Volvo right now. I really would be, it's just, it would be, it, it, and, and yeah, they seem to be embracing 12, it. 12,000 six years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it yeah, doesn't cost anything. There. All I do is all I do is make money. I mean, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, well, that's a that's a logical business plan, though. So you get the twelve thousand dollar truck. You prove that you can do the business, right? Right. So, so all the right. all the operations are the same. You don't have that expense. Hopefully, it's not a 
a twelve thousand dollar truck that cost you, you know, a hundred thousand to keep on the road for that amount of time, which right. which also happens if you bought the wrong twelve thousand dollar truck. But you know, bank that. You know, don't 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 spend any money on that thing. Use it up. And and now that you've got a business model that works and you've proven that you could do it with your twelve thousand dollar truck, go get yourself a nice truck that gets eleven yeah. miles to the gallon. Why yeah. not? It, really, that well, is see, the, that is my a truck really was in the shop. logical progression in this industry. Start with a cheap truck. You take so much of the risk away when you can do that. That's the biggest advantage to having that cheap truck in the beginning. You take out a bunch of risk and you don't have that giant payment staring at you every month. Right. And, and okay, so you, you get to that prove and my that, get- that you can do the business, right? right. So you, right. you built the business around it. So obviously your bookkeeping's working. Obviously your business practices are working. So you built all that infrastructure, shall we say, around that cheap truck without a payment. And like I said, and again, I hope the, the service wasn't off the deep end. But if you still made money, even if that was the case, then you're in good shape. And I mean, there's, there's not much risk involved in going out and getting yourself a modern truck. Here's the other big advantage to it. Yeah, but I'm afraid Wait. of the modern truck just well, because I rented a rider truck for seven weeks. Hold while on. My truck stop. was in the body Kim, shop. Stop. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to let you finish that sentence. I have so much experience with this. Okay. Because of my operation at FedEx, I could not have downtime. I had to fulfill my contract. I had runs that had to go every day. So if a truck needed work done, I had rental trucks. I rented trucks all the time. It was a very common occurrence. Ryder, Penske, they suck. I don't know what they do to their trucks. They're the worst trucks I've ever driven. They get awful fuel economy. I don't even know how they do it. If I set out to spec a truck that bad, I don't think I could match what they managed to accomplish. <laughs> so, so don't yeah, use that, that as an example. example. That's a horrible yeah. example. Yeah, it's, it's okay. so, you know, I want to go okay. back a second. Here's another advantage to doing it the way you did it with the cheap truck first. We now also have all the numbers we need. When somebody comes to me and they've never been in business and they want to go buy a new truck or an expensive truck, how do we know how to even budget whether they can afford it or not? We don't know how much revenue they're going to generate. We don't know how good they are at managing expenses. They're probably not. But we have all of that history for you now. Now we can just plug in a couple new numbers. Look, we're going to have to probably plug in a truck payment unless you have cash to pay for this thing. We're going to have to plug in a higher insurance number. Hopefully, we can plug in a better fuel mileage number and a better maintenance number. And now we can look at it and go, oh, yeah, look, this isn't even very risky at all. Or we could look at it and go, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Maybe you've built a business model here around your cheap truck, and maybe you don't have enough revenue to really justify a brand new truck. I don't know, but the good news is we should know because you should have all those numbers we can look at. Absolutely. So the, the real, there, there is no – well, here's the if thing. My, there is no right answer if, to this question. It really right. comes down to what you're most comfortable with. And there is nothing wrong with if staying with older. Down, I'm looking at a, if my truck breaks down, I'm looking at maybe a $2,000 bill. It, Shoot, right. I'm hearing these right. new trucks break down, and I see them on the side of the road all the time. All, you know, they're newer trucks. I don't know if it's driver error or what it is. It, most of it, we, you know, no, I know that, that you say budget for. Well, hold hold on, I, we can tell you what it is. That's what this Friday show <laughs> is really kind of turned into. How do you spec new trucks okay. and drive them so that you don't have all those maintenance problems? We now know we have some control over that. We used to feel like that that's okay. just they built these trucks and they suck and they break down and they're expensive and what do we do? Well, we've been working on it long enough. We now know what to do. We know if you spec the truck right, keeping it in the right operating range, temperature, RPM, that many of those emissions problems go away. We also know that if you've got the wrong truck and you're having some of those problems, the catalyst really does work. So we do have some answers either way. I use a catalyst on the N14. 
Yeah, and you know, on the N14, right, I, we've that, seen you know, we've seen it help with pre-emission engines, and if it does, great. Mm-hmm. But the real key here on the catalyst, I think, the biggest success story are those engines that were just getting fouled up with soot, and the catalyst is really helping those. Yeah, I mean, before the catalyst, I have dual stacks, and they they used to be black tips. Now they're not. Now they're not black. Yeah, it's not as They're critical not shiny on shiny chrome unless I yeah, get a wash. It, put it. It's not as critical no. on an N14 as it is on an emission engine because when you start sooting up those engines, you, you they get expensive. But yeah. so, like I was saying, there's no wrong answer here. If you decide to keep the truck you have, nothing wrong with that. If you decide you do want to go out and well, now, learned- here's what I would say: anybody who wants to go buy a new truck really should focus almost exclusively on fuel and maintenance costs when you spec it. Get those as low as you possibly can. If you want to go spend all that money on a new truck, do it, but you should be shooting for 10 miles to the gallon. I can and I have a pretty good coach, too. Um, well, I listen to your show all the time, but there's a guy in Allen, Michigan, that does alignments for MD. His name is Jim. Mm-hmm. Oh, Fowler. Yeah. And I talked to Jim yeah. Yeah. Jim's a great I mean, guy. He used to do a lot of things that used to. Oh, man, that guy, he's a wealth of knowledge. So how long have and, you um, been listening yeah. to the show? Uh, I listened to it when you were on overnight. So I stopped listening to it when you and Kim kept saying health, health, health. I'm like, <laughs> shut this guy up. We're still, I, you know what? Kim's not here anymore, but Lauren and I are still saying it. No, the reason I ask, back in yeah. 2007, pretty sure, yeah, it was still 2007, we, we started a show called Turnaround, and it was, I think we did it on Friday nights. Um, I was actually doing seven shows a week back then, two of them were recorded, but we were doing seven shows a week, or, you know, new shows. So this idea for the show Turnaround was that I would find an owner-operator who was struggling, and I would fly in, no matter where they were in the country, I'd fly in. If they didn't have accounting, we would do their accounting. I would crawl all over the truck. Um, we you know, fuel mileage. I, I would just tear the whole business apart and start showing what steps we would take to turn around the business and make it profitable. Uh, Jim was one of my first uh, subjects on that show. Oh, wow. Oh, look yeah. at that. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's passing on that knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. He, he has what, been for a long time, you. 15 years. Yeah. You know, some of us have to do it wrong before we can do it right. And yep. we need to pass that, that, that along. <laughs> yep. That's why. So you were like, you were like trucking, you were like trucking Gordon Ramsay, huh? So that's, you were like rest, restaurant rescue. That's yeah. kind of where I got the idea. <laughs> yeah. That was where I got the idea. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, the problem was. Well, oh my gosh. Can not, you see Kevin yelling not, at somebody? Not yes, only. Oh, is, is, that big, that's. No, that should be a TV show. That, 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 yeah. Well, wait a minute. It, it was somewhere. I have like four, oh, really? four episodes of this show professionally filmed by a film crew. <laughs> so you did it, your sizzle reel. Did you, did you pitch it to like Discovery Channel or anything? What did you do? Well, I was go. That was the point. I was going to that thing. Two thousand and seven. <laughs> the, these types of shows were just becoming popular. And uh, that was my idea. And I can tell you where I failed. I, you I didn't get a hold of Mike Rowe. No, I couldn't pull off the asshole attitude. And I should have. That, <laughs> that's why people watch Gordon Ramsay. They don't watch because somebody's going to burn the souffle. They watch because they want Gordon Ramsay to go off on them and call them names. Right. Right. So I was Mr. Nice Guy. I'm not going to call anybody names. So my show was totally boring. And I realized after it (laughs) failed why it failed. All of those shows exist because of all the drama, right? That's all. Nobody cares about somebody learning how to run a restaurant better. That's not why people watch those shows. They watch the shows for the drama. And mine had none. 
I, I totally blew it on that. It was costing me like a minimum of like $6,000 an episode to film this. We, it was, it actually, the, the episodes that I did film actually played on Park and View for a while. That's awesome. Yeah. I, did, I had no idea. I did get them on Park and View. Yeah, there, and, and I'm still in touch with, with some of the people. Now, Jim's was not one that we filmed. His was one of the first ones we did on the radio show. Then I, I took the idea out to film it. And I, I'm still in touch with some of those people that were on those episodes. There's actually, actually, you, you could, there's, you can maybe do it. You, you may have learned how to be an asshole, Kevin. I bet you could do it. <laughs> I, 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 I could. <laughs> Kevin's going to be like the guy on dodgeball. If you can dodge a red, you can dodge a ball. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah so, so as, I, as we get older, that becomes easier. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I tried it. I tried it. It just, uh, it, it failed. <laughs> I had fun oh, doing awesome. it, though. Yeah, it was a lot of fun filming it. I had a ball. We filmed all over. I did an episode in Houston. I did one in Michigan. Um, did one in Kentucky. Where else did I go? We went all over the place. And I, the, the film crew I had was kind of fun. The... Um, the guy that uh, kind of so that have, have the Aaron. Aaron needs to make these available on the on the on the website. You, hey, know, you need I, that. You need to have a site. You need we, to put these things out. We got to figure out if they if we still even have them somewhere. I'm not completely convinced we have them. Now I do know okay. they must be available somewhere. Here's how I know. Re- remember the whole Chris in Delaware fiasco. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He actually went and dug up one of those shows from Turnaround. He found one somewhere, and he pulled out the piece on the Turbo 3000. We did a whole thing on the, the Turbo <laughs> 3000 back then. And he actually found it and pulled it out and was posting it all over the place. So, yeah, it's still around. That's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Turbo Three Thousand of all things, of course, yeah. So, yeah. Uh-huh. so we should do a whole thing of all the little gimmicky things like that that have come out over the years. Oh, the one the that fuel I fuel re- magnets were my favorite. The, yeah, I remember the fuel magnets; those were big. The other one that I had a, <laughs> I just had so much fun harassing the guy at a truck show. Printed flexible circuit boards that you stuck on the outside of your fuel tank. And they changed the molecular structure of the fuel so it burns better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I was going to use a slick 50. Yeah, was, well, there you go. No, you're not. They got put out of business by the government a long time ago. You know you're bad when the government puts you out of business. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that could be a whole show. We could do a whole show we, on, on, we could. on all those things. That'd yeah. be fun. You know, the, <laughs> the the whole Slick 50 thing used to go to the trade shows, and they'd always have a little engine sitting there, right? And they'd show, this stuff is so mm-hmm. good, it will run without oil, right? Without oil, yeah. Do yeah. You know, they always used the same engine. It was a Briggs and Stratton. Uh, that, that. Yeah, it was a Briggs and Stratton. That when you took the oil plug out, it left like a half a quart of oil in there, and that's all. Right. That was enough yeah, lubrication. So there was oil right. around in there. Yeah, yeah, there was just enough lubrication that if it's just sitting there running with no real load on it, it would run just fine. It was fine. Yeah. <laughs> those are those were good. Yeah, slick fifty. I forgot about that. Oh one yeah, too. that was. That'd be fun. Kim, what else you got? Well, I was talking to Lisa about what's going on with our daughter. You know, a few years ago, I had a heart attack and weighed 330-some pounds. Now I'm down into... Oh, Say that and again. My wife got you, on board. You, you we broke saw up. I missed, Jack. I missed the new yeah. weight. Oh, about 225. That, I stopped oh, weighing myself after con, I started feeling really good. Congratulations. That, that's incredible. You know, I, when I did hey. this, I lost about 40 or 45 pounds. John, I know you were probably right around that same number. And that I'm about to, 40, yeah. Yeah, I was 40, yeah. That, to me, was absolutely life-changing. Like, nothing else I've ever done in my life was more important than that, really. I, and I, I 
absolutely believe that. I think you do too. I can't imagine what it's like to lose that much weight. That must be incredible. Oh, yeah. I used to just be, I get to a shipper and just sit in my truck and do nothing. Now I get to the shipper and I'm like, hey, I'm going on a walkabout. I'll see you guys half hour, 40 minutes. See, um, see we got this. Stay in your truck. We got this so backwards because we told all the fatties they had to go out and exercise. That's not going to happen. It's just, you're not going to do it. You're physically not <laughs> capable of doing it, and you'll hurt yourself. We had to sh- finally figure out how to show people how to lose weight without moving. And this is really the first. See, that was it. When I yeah. tell people all I ate was meat and fat and it, oh, wait. <laughs> no, no, just no, no I don't. Fat. <laughs> I'm chewing on fat. You're throwing away the piece of fat off the pork chop. Give that to me. I'll take it. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So my wife got on board because Dr. Jack just looked at her and said, hey, this is going a lot easier for Kim if you get on board. Do- so Dr. she's been on board since Dr. the first time. Jack Wolfson? Dr. Jack Wolfson. Oh, excellent. Yep. Excellent. I'm glad you're working with him. Yes. So years ago, yep, years ago, we went down there and we're still doing his protocol, still working with him. And you were right. One of your shows, uh, his coaches are just amazing. They are. They know yeah. they're just amazing. Yep. So anyway, our, our oldest daughter is married, has two kids, and she's on the program too. She finally got on board with her husband. Maybe not as clean, but they're doing a great job. You can see her attitude or just, she's just happier and the kids are, they've got energy. They're great. Well, one's in first grade and she packs his lunch. Well, sure. I'll just make it short. She wrote the school and said, I don't want my kids having candy, no cookies, no grains, no, none of that. So she packs her lunch. Well, somebody at the school is quite upset, and they got a hold of the county, which they did a wellness check, because apparently if you eat healthy the right way, that your kid is malnutritioned. And this kid is nowhere, <laughs> these kids are nowhere near malnutritioned. And they're not getting, hey, you know, they're not getting hey, their healthy fiber. Hey, they're not getting their... Speaking um, of this, speaking of this, I have to jump in with this. Yeah. Oh, and we're going to be bringing Steve Crone into the conversation here in just a minute. Um, Steve's oh, on hold, yeah. Um, but speaking of that eating thing, and Sarah just sent me a commercial she heard on Sirius XM. I, I'm not sure what that whole Sirius XM thing is. Does anybody know? <laughs> no, I'm not familiar with audio road these days. I'm not familiar with that. But Sarah was listening. Here, here's basically. I'm, I'm just going to read what she wrote because it's kind of a synopsis of the commercial. First off, it starts off with a woman speaking. Tired of chicken for dinner? Try Kellogg's cereal and see how deliciously fun dinner can be. Oh. The man says, "Wait, cereal for dinner? Well, duh." Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, flakes, Fruit Loops, and Frosted Mini Weights make a delicious dinner for the whole family. The man says, then why have I been shopping for 45 minutes? And the woman says, beats me. (laughs) Kind of thought we had a vibe going there. Bring fun to dinner with Kellogg's cereal. How disgusting is this? Oh, my God. Well, you know what makes it really disgusting? You know how Kellogg. See, I'm from Michigan, so Battle Creek is right down the road. Kellogg started his loony bin, and he didn't want his people inside playing with themselves. So he decided that <laughs> Frosted Flakes or yeah, no, Corn no, Flakes. You, you're, you're on. You're on to the right. You, you almost got it there. You're exactly right. He started a sanatorium. For a, a, so, but he thought that masturbation was like the root of all evil, and it was destroying the world. And meat made you masturbate more. That was the whole idea behind the cereal. <laughs> so you didn't eat too much meat. That's how Kellogg's got started. Yeah. Now you know how your Fruit Loops got started. <laughs> uh, my God. That's awful. Yeah, I, know. I so I'm struggling with this a little bit right now with my kids. Uh, they, they 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 just won't believe. Their mom won't believe. They are. Um, it, it, it's amazing. They they're, they're incredibly smart. They're straight A students. They're 
Um, yeah, it, it, I can't get my Julia, who's an excellent athlete, and, and they're super fit, but they eat the standard American diet. Right. And maybe so, even a sugary version of it. I mean, they, they, they still do soda, and they still, you know, they, they, they yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I had a Pepsi or something. I just, I just only, it, it doesn't even turn me on anymore. Right. Um, so Julia's starting to have some, and, and she might push a little too hard starting to have some joint issues and some other little things go on. And I'm like, Julia, I said, just stop the inflammatory foods. It's like, what? So I gave her a copy of Dietitian's <laughs> Dilemma because the parallels between her oh, th- and yes. the woman who wrote that book yes. are incredible. Good, good so, recommendation. You know, she's, she's a whopping 90 pounds and five foot three ish. And, and maybe she's a hundred pounds, but she, you know, she's, she's thin and fit and strong. And she runs every day. She probably does at least ten miles a day. She's done half marathons. She's done a she's done a triathlon. She, and, yeah, she's a, and then she's, she's going to have problems. Things. Like she's not. She's having them now. Yeah, yeah. She's starting it's, to have knee issues. Yeah. Starting to have other issues. And I'm like, just try it. You're young enough. I just I said, just try carnivore for two weeks. Like, just try it. Okay. When you start, you're going to have the shits. It's probably not going to be fun initially. <laughs> you're going to get past it. That's your body detoxing, right? right? So, right. So just try it and see if your joint pain goes away and you know I, I used every excuse in the book as to why my knees hurt like i hurt them skiing i of did course, this i did right, that you know right. what they don't hurt anymore i I, fucking I, fine. I have like, the exact same experience my <laughs> neck i i have spent so much money on chiropractors my whole life because i constantly had to have my neck adjusted no more i never go to chiropractors anymore I, I, I don't. I don't get it. In my fingers, like I thought. Okay, I'm gonna make. You know, really, I'm a glorified mechanic. But first and foremost, I'm a mechanic. I work on stuff every day. I'm spinning the wrenches nonstop. You know, and when I'm at the track, I just have my laptop and I do my engineering stuff for real. But I mean, I'm really a mechanic more right. than anything. And so my my fingers were like my my pointer finger. I couldn't. I couldn't. You know, go the whole way to where my where my uh, print pad would touch you know, inside, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I'm like, Oh, well, it's our age. It's going to happen. Right. It's what happens. Right. It's, you know, I've been spinning wrenches my whole life. Yeah. My yeah. knuckle should hurt. You nope. know what? They don't nope. anymore. Nope. <laughs> I know. And, and, and they, and, and I can move my finger the whole way now, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, yeah, it's amazing to me. But, and you know, she's 16, she's young, she's a little blast furnace. So she could probably eat the not good stuff. Right. For a while. And still seem right. to think she's healthy. Yeah, for a while. Although. But it's starting to happen although, now. So, yeah. And, and you know you read the book. Uh, her name was Michelle, wasn't it? The dietitian still. Michelle Hearn. Yeah, yeah, yeah Michelle, Michelle Hearn. Hearn. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. look at how early her problems started in life. A lot of women, women oh, athletes absolutely. especially, start to see a really big deterioration in their health around college time. Right. That's My a, daughter is on that path. That is a she, very, very common story. And they think I'm nuts or I'm sort of some sort of conspiracy theorist about the diet stuff and whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, not a conspiracy. They just got it wrong. It, it, was, it, it, was, it, was, it was it was a combination of the fact that, one, it's legal for them to market food and Correct. drugs in the way that right. they do. So right. it, from a business standpoint, the food industry, the drug industry, and everything would be foolish to not do what they've done. Of right? course. It, it's, just, it, right. It's, it's good business, right? It was legal. They could do it. Yeah. Make gazillions of dollars. And it, that's what happens. So no, well, so it's not a conspiracy. It, it's just we got it wrong. That's all. Right. They just got it wrong. Right. <laughs> and yeah, and, yeah but look at look and, at the circle. You've I, got Bayer. They own Roundup. They own the the medicine that is supposed to make you feel better, <laughs> and the food. They they own a ton of food. So right there, too, they're right. funding the doctors. Oh yeah, yeah from fertilizer right. on down to yeah, you got it. Yeah, right. it's, it's right. Yeah. Now here's the thing. And they're paying John, the doctors I, I, to tell you. I believe exactly yeah. like you do. This was not a conspiracy theory. Was not. They they did it just because it was good business. They had a product. They marketed it. The product sold well. They figured out how to, how to make it very addictive with the whole bliss point thing. But it was all legal. They weren't doing anything illegal. Right. So, but now, now I believe there are people that know this is completely wrong, and they'll never admit it because this system makes so much money. It's you know, yeah, it would be bad for the economy if people started eating right. Absolutely, it would, would be. be. The economy it, it would, would take be. a hit. I guarantee. Yeah. If those companies all went out of business, oh, or stopping as profitable, right. there, it would, there would, it would be a hit. Right. So yeah, so so now they're in protectionary mode, right? Where they're gonna, 
use every excuse in the book to, to protect that and buy every politician they can that's going to vote their way and get their things, and that's going to be what they do. That's how it works. Yep. And again, that's not a conspiracy. That's just that's business. Just reality. <laughs> you know, right. It's, it's it works. Reality. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We, uh, we're going to add Steve Cronin. Hey, I've got a picture. Oh, Where can I send this picture to you? Um, I got this pic- I'm not. I'm not on either of the tribes. I just listen. Send it to. I have this picture. Support. Uh, Bib Overhouse. Yeah, send it and to. I think they were size 50, 52. Oh, I've abs- got a picture of my wife and I in the bibs. We want those. We oh. absolutely. Oh, want really? Those. Yeah. So uh, these are the hey, bibs wait. that I that were so tight on me. I couldn't get the three buttons buttoned. And my wife wow. and I can now fit in those bibs. No, you both fit in there. Hey, yeah. I have to ask a quick question before you go, Kim. Because you said you listened way back when and you stopped because of the health stuff. What brought you back around oh, yeah, to question. actually being a believer and in, in going down this path? Yeah, because you'd mentioned earlier that you listened to the show early on and then you went to, uh, you, you weren't, weren't enjoying the, the health talk and you got away from it and now you're back. Well, wait, you're more than back. You're, you're, you're obviously uh, on board. It was a heart attack. Oh yeah, well that would do it. I was having a I was having a heart attack, and I was driving through Chicago land, and I'm like, I'm not going to any Chicago doctor. <laughs> and then the pains went away. I made it up to Wisconsin, and everything was good. And I'm like, I made my delivery. I took a nap, woke up, and it was just awful. So I called the hospital, and I'm like, Hey, do you have cardio? She's like, No, you have to go to Milwaukee or Chicago. And I was over by Racine. And I'm like, well, what hospital is? And then she's like, Waukesha has a great heart program. I drove to Waukesha. Wow. <laughs> and um, the funny, the funny thing, the funny thing on that story. Okay, I know that it was uh, unsafe. But the thing is, I'm wearing my headset. My wife called the hospital and said, "Hey, he's coming. He's going to park his truck right in front of the hospital. Can you go get him?" So people are running around looking for me. I'm standing at the desk telling them I have a heart attack, and they're like, oh, fill out this paper, go sit down over there. And just by luck, some one of the people pushing the wheelchair is like, hey, are you Kim? I'm like, yeah, you're having a heart attack. Come sit down. We're going to take you in. I'm like, tell her. I've been telling her that for the last couple of minutes. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you're going to go to the emergency, make sure you have your wife call ahead of time so they believe. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you know, good. I listened to Kevin's show. Dr. Jack was on, and my wife and I listened to Dr. Jack's book. Meanwhile, we're seeing a doctor back in Kalamazoo, and he's like, you're going to take these drugs for the rest of your life. Your cholesterol is too high. You're going to take this. We're going to triple the dose, you know, the whole spiel. I'm like, doctor, I'm not taking all these meds. And then he looked at my wife and said, you better get his affairs in order because if he doesn't take these medications, you're going to be a widow. Oh, and my wife yeah. just lost her right there. Of course she lost it. It was she didn't want to lose her husband. Yeah. So yeah. there that day in the parking lot we decided that we were gonna go and see Dr. Jack. It was like three weeks later we made an appointment and we were down there and been with Dr. Jack ever since. Excellent. All right. Hey John, I just So moved. listen to John, Kevin Kevin on. and his one, heart. One second. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, one second. John, I just moved you back into the queue for a second. Um, and we're going to bring Steve Crone into the conversation. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, Kim, thanks for the call and the update. That was awesome as well. Uh, all right. Steve, are you there? Uh-oh. What did I do wrong? thought I pressed all the right buttons. Steve? Hmm. Let me put Steve back into the queue. Lisa's call screening for us today, which is awesome. Um, Lisa, can you check Steve's line? And I'm going to bring John back on. John, are you there? There you are. Yeah, I'm here. Yep, yeah, I'm I can here. hear you. Yep. I don't know why I can't hear Steve. That whole line was completely quiet there. Um, all right. Boy, we've been all over the board today, haven't we? Well, I love that story of Kim's there. Um, you know, obviously he's on no meds now and he was going on about eating all his meats and fats and the stuff other people were trimming off. And 
you know, he survived a heart attack and lost 120 pounds or something. That's yeah, amazing. It is. It, it, it is. You know what? It, it's, and I know I hear this in your voice with your own kids and people around you. The worst part about this is the frustration that you want everybody to do this. And it's just not going to happen. You, you want, you know, some of the people that are closest to you to do it. Sometimes that's not even going to happen. That's the most frustrating part no. about this is to finally figure out, not that we got it wrong. We did get it wrong, but we got it so wrong and we perpetuated and so many people suffer every day because of it. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I don't understand it. It doesn't take long to, to figure it out. I mean, it really doesn't. And there there are enough books and things out there that aren't written by quacks. And, and I, I equally like the doctors who've seen the light as well as the journalists. I mean, my favorite are, you know, like Dr. Perlmutter and Dr. Um, Davis. What's the guy from Ohio? Oh, uh, yeah. The, guy the Cleveland the, Clinic. Uh, the Cleveland guy. Cle- yeah, yeah, that guy. Um regardless and then you know Ty Schultz and Gary Tobbs I mean the, right. the journalists who've just you know done, done investigative journalism on this and it's not you know wacky conspiracy theory it's not QAnon stuff it's not the right. government actually out to right. get us it, it, it's, it really is just a mistake it is. you know it, right. it's just a mistake and you know you just you know someone needs to own it and they need to step up and say okay maybe these guidelines are wrong but you know, there's so much profit in it and there's so much business in it on the drug end and the food end that I don't know how that happens. I really have, don't. Have, speaking of this, have you seen the new food rating program they're bringing out? No, I have. I don't, oh, I don't my God. I, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I'm pretty so, sure I don't even want to see it. So, you know, we had the whole food pyramid for years and then they figured out they didn't like that picture anymore. So they did the whole my plate thing, but nothing changed. None of their recommendations right. changed. They just changed the graphic they were using. But I was starting to get a little encouraged. They were kind of the, the group that gets together to set these standards was actually looking at the whole issue around fat. And, and they were actually starting to improve, I thought, some of their recommendations around fat. But now they're coming out with a food scoring system. So they're going to give every food a score. The higher the score, the more of that food you should have in your diet. And I didn't even dig into how they do the scoring because it's completely obvious. Let me give you one of the most outrageous examples. They score a fake egg, an egg substitute, fried in margarine, scores much, much higher than a real egg fried in butter. Where do they get this data? Like, that's Ke- unbelievable. The, I'm not exaggerating. You're going to think I'm lying when I say this. Kellogg's Fruit Loop scores higher than ground beef. Yeah, that's, that's absurd. Isn't that awful? Yeah, that's that's going to be our new... And all, you know, and a lot of people say, well, who cares? You can ignore that. Well, you can ignore it, but you were just talking about kids. The schools, all the school lunch programs are based on these recommendations. They always have been. Based on that. And hospitals. Well, it's, it's. It's kind of funny. So at the, at the track last week, and, and I see this a lot, and I, I don't know how to approach it or, or what I, how, and again, who, who am I to do anything? Uh, you know, the vegans and vegetarians can get special treatment like crazy. Like every caterer has some vegan option or some vegetarian <laughs> option or whatever. Where's my grain-free option? I'm sorry. I'm offended. I like I, I will go full on with, with the zeal of every vegan in the world on carnivore <laughs> at some point. Like I, I, I like, why not? You know, like, right. like there's, you know, like, you know, I'll, I'll boycott their restaurants or do whatever until they oh, have a, a I, proper carnivore option. Yeah. Right. I, so, let me give yeah. you, an, let me give you an example of that. The other day we were in downtown Portland. I don't go there much anymore. I used to love going to Portland. It's just a quirky little fun town, fun food, all kind. I, we oh, I love Portland. Yeah, they have yeah, destroyed yeah. Portland. Portland, I we I don't even want to go anymore. We had to go. We were down there for okay. a reason. We're walking down the street, you know, south side of Portland, and there's a coffee shop. Coffee shops everywhere. Let's go in and get a cup of coffee. So I walk in and I decide I want a latte. 
Um, no sweetener. I just want, you know, good, heavy, full cream in my espresso. Yep. Yep. Um, so I order a latte and she said, is oat milk okay? And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. What, not. what are my other <laughs> options? And she said, well, if you don't want oat milk, we have soy and coconut and hemp. And I'm like, what about cream? They didn't have it. Zero. None. I said, really wasn't I there. said then I don't so, want a latte. I mean, a lot of people love to hate Starbucks, but they have proper heavy cream. For exactly. Coffee. You could order a coffee with heavy cream Look, at any Starbucks and, anywhere. And and my, my local coffee shop that I stop at every morning is called Mechanic Coffee. They keep heavy cream for me. Good. <laughs> so I walk Good. in, I know I want yeah. my, and I get my latte with heavy cream. And right. It is delicious. I love, yeah, it's, uh, it, and I, then when I tell people the only thing good for you in milk is the fat, so like just, you know, the, the rest of it's sugar, you yeah, know, you, you don't fat. want the lactose, what you want right. is the fat. You want full you, fat. You give it to me, right. man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, I don't care if you bring in all those other crazy milks, go ahead. But you, did you really get rid of the cream? They did. Oh, that's ridiculous i know hey yeah it's steve, somehow cruel to the to the cow to milk it i guess yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> steve are you lurking back there somewhere why can't we hear steve? steve or steve can't hear us or something um boy i put him back in the queue i would have thought hey lisa try that try that again um we may end up Steve was probably going to be our last call. Just call him. <laughs> well, that's going to take at least a half an hour. Yeah, he's going to be last. Oh, well, that's kind of what I figured, yeah. once I figured once we got him on here, we'd be good for another half hour at least. My gosh. Uh, but we can't get him in for some reason. Uh, get, get him in. Oh. I could call you. Just call him. Yeah, we, we lost him. We lost him, so... Lisa, I could text. I could text Lisa's phone number. Uh, she well, it. she's got his phone. Oh, she's calling him right now. I can see on the board she's calling him okay, this good. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm sure Steve has something good to Maybe. add to our conversation today. So, using his so that conversation we had with Kim and what kind of truck he wants. I mean, I, as much as I love Steve's truck, um, it, it, it makes a ton of sense for Steve. Your average schmo can't do that. No, I um, right, just the right. just the engine programming and then the VG turbo and the way we've got that series sixty to actually be as close to a downsped engine as as a modern as, as an old engine can be. Um, I'm not sure that that's for everyone. It's, it's, yeah, you, you know, it's it's a great story. It's really cool. You and, know, I just yeah, but it's, I just thought of a term we used to use all the time with cars. Remember what we used to refer to as a sleeper? Yep. That's Steve. Yeah, he's a sleeper. That's right. Steve in the fuel yeah. mileage game. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. You'd, yeah. Yep. Can you hear me now? Oh, we do. Oh, there he is. There's the sleeper. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I went out of my office, and I'm sitting outside in the car so that... Uh, I don't get real good reception in the office. It might have been on my end here. The problem was, but uh, anyways, I'm here. Hey, I guess we can John, hear each other. Hey, John. Yeah. John, are you on some kind of a headset? Yes. I am on my diesel can, headset right now, yeah. Can you move the boom down? We're getting a ton of, like, breathing yep. noise. Okay. Is there that we better? go. That's much better. Steve, what do you have today? Okay. Oh, well, I, uh, geez, there's all kinds of stuff. I'd like, you know, Dr. Graham, the guy who made grain crackers is just like Dr. Kellogg too. Cause <laughs> you figured everybody was over sex by eating good food. So, <laughs> Hey, Hey, look, he's, but, it, they, they were not completely off track here. The, when you start eating carnivore, the testosterone levels do go up. They weren't completely off yeah, track with that. Isn't that a good thing? Uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> they just see that was that That's was the thing. early no. that was the early version of toxic masculinity. Some people get freaked <laughs> out when men are too much like men. <laughs> well, you know, uh, this whole food thing, uh, it, it's. Uh, particular problem in my family because we have a doctor in the family. Uh-oh. And 
you know, <laughs> yeah, they, it's, uh, they all talk to her and, oh, no, that you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, John, I gave you the recommendation once of that uh, book, The Scout Mindset, you know, yep. by Julia Gallif. And one of the studies in there, it showed that the more people understood science, the farther they are apart, and, and they use particularly global warming, you know, so each side has their points and, uh, you know, they get entrenched and they won't listen to the other side. And I don't care which side you're on, there's, there's you know, there's, there's good data that shows this or that, and we can disagree on what causes it and, and whatever. And But uh, people get entrenched and it's that way, you know, people know what they know and they, they don't want to hear anything else. And, you know, that's, that's a problem with all sorts of things. So. You know, I think global warming is right. a good example of this though. And I, I think I have a different take on global warming than most people. I, I don't disagree and climate change, I really think is a better term because we don't know that it's going it to is. keep warming up. It could get cold again. That happened not that long ago, a couple decades ago, we were worried about an ice age. It, and it is changing. I okay. agree with that. But why would we think it wouldn't? The, the, the earth has changed yeah. from, from whenever we can first figure out that it was here. All the continents used to be one landmass. That's a pretty big change. I mean, that's a little more than, you know, a half a degree of hotter climate in, you know, a 10-year period. So, of course, the earth is going to continue changing. And do humans affect it? How could we not? How could 8 billion people or however many we have here do all the things humans do and not have an impact on this? Of course we do. Here's my take, though, and, and I'll separate health from climate change because it's a good example. I am completely convinced we know probably 80 to 90 percent of everything we need to know to make human beings outrageously healthy compared to where they are today. I'm completely convinced we know how to do it. We'll get better at it over time, but we're pretty damn good at it right now. And we don't even need doctors. You read a couple books and it, this is not rocket science. But when it comes to climate change, I think it's the exact opposite. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We don't know what the answer is to this. And that's my problem is without knowing answers, we keep running off doing all kinds of big stuff and spending all kinds of money that could be making things worse. Well, I, I agree with that. And it's interesting you bring up about plate tectonics, you know, with the land masses moving, you know, where we're in a real thin crust in this molten uh, center and, you know, how the molten center, uh, the tides in there moving, you know, and the uh, poles shifting and it gets close and it heats up parts of the ocean and the currents change. And how do you how do you forecast that? It just it just doesn't happen. In the beginning, they didn't even have the sun in the models. Now they're actually forecasting the weather and the sun, which is a good thing. But I mean, there's uh, there's astrophysics, there's geophysics, there's, there's so much stuff that gets in there. How do we forecast and say, by God, you know, we're going to put up windmills and all the cars are going to be electric and everything's going to be solved. Uh, CO2 is 33 thousandths of a percent of, of uh, <laughs> our, our air, you know, the atmosphere. And maybe four hundredths of a percent. That's the difference. You know, you, you look at Wikipedia, it's four hundredths and if you look somewhere else it's thirty three thousandths. You're talking about seven thousand of a percent difference and let's just blow our whole economy and let's dig up lithium everywhere and make batteries and everything's gonna be fine. I, I just it drives me nuts. I but anyways I think what people should do is pull only aerodynamic trailers and <laughs> well, I'm that, my, that, I'm, I'm, that's I'm my worst enemy. I don't, I don't believe her in this to save the planet. I just, it's right. just the right I don't thing either. to do. I, exactly. Well, yeah. that's how I feel too. Yeah, we creating there. There is nothing wrong with creating fewer carbon emissions. I'm sorry, there, correct. There is nothing wrong with that at all. 
Like, I mean, why, why not? It's, it's, it's actually a conservative thing to do. Let's, let's not, you know, let's, let's try to, you know, we don't need to continue to try to burn more hey, hydrocarbons when we don't hey, have to. Hey, don't get hey, me wrong. I hey, mean, hey, we, we, hey, John, we, there, there's just, a logical reason to burn them. Just, just, just why burn. not try to burn less? Yeah. yeah. And I don't disagree with that on, on its face, but I want to know kind of where you're coming from. Have you read the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels? I have not, but I heard you talk about it, and that's on my list, actually. I think I have it. I already have it on Audible. I just haven't uh, been in the car long enough to read it lately. I believe the author, if I can go back through my notes here, um, I believe the author has a new book out. Um, Okay. Where is it? I could have swore I made a note on it somewhere. I'll go find it. Um, Oh, yeah, here it is. Alex Epstein is the author. Fossil Future is his new book. Okay. I haven't read it yet. I just put it on my Kindle yesterday, I think. So I want to read. It definitely changed my mind somewhat. I, I'm kind of the same way. You know, I, I'm, I was a huge proponent of electric everything. I still am. I love the technology itself, but it has nothing to do with the fact that it's going to save the planet because I'm not convinced that it will. And I don't know that anybody right. can prove that it will. There's, there's that whole issue of unintended consequences. And I think we're going to see a bunch of them from this last push to go electric before we're anywhere near ready to go electric. So fossil fuels are going to be around for a long time. Now, I am okay with saying, okay, we know they're here. They're going to be here forever. We're not going to run out of them. That doesn't mean we can just just, you know, say we're going to pollute the, the world and the air and not even think about it. Well, of course, we should be looking for something better, but we've screwed this up so many times, and it's almost always the government. I wish they would just get the hell out of this whole issue. Stop with all the tax credits. Why, why, why should you take some of my tax money and give it to somebody who bought a Tesla truck? That makes no sense to me. You're going to give them $40,000 of my money. The government spending money is another reason I called. Um, Joe Morrow posted a post from the super trailer that's going to California. And you look at it, there's no aerodynamics on it anyway. They got this huge gap between the truck and the trailer. And it's like, I, you know, why don't they send some money my way? I could that's get right. done with my project. Right. I, 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 you know, I don't want to apply for that. I don't, I, you know, I, I'd have to go through so, so much diversity, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> training and stuff. I, I don't want to. I don't want to bother with that. You know, I, I don't think there's anybody that that believes in uh, you know economy as as much as I do, and uh, I uh, it drives me crazy when I see the government waste money. So, uh, well, you know, you and I get how this happens and why it happens and. You know, it's easy for us to sit here and say, why didn't you give us just half of that $15 million you spent on that super truck project? And we haven't heard anything about it for five years. Um, You know, you look at it and you go, where'd the $15 million go? I, I posted a, a video. I, I've been wanting to do this for a while. I had to talk my son into it there. We, uh, I drove over a camera so everybody could see what the underside of my truck looked like. Uh, you know, everybody wants to know how the splitter works and, you know, all of this stuff. So I, I drove over the entire length there. I don't know if you saw it or not. I haven't uh, seen that. I want to. Quite a bit of reaction. Oh, it's really quite cool. Quite a bit of yeah. reaction. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, you were talking about uh, outreach and stuff. It's kind of interesting because with Facebook, you know, it'll tell you the insights. And there's like close to 3,000 people saw it. That just means they saw it. There's 1,100 people that that, uh, clicked on it. And there's like 200 and some, I I forget how many uh, uh, comments. And, you know, it's more than anything I've ever put up. But... uh, yeah, so you say if, if to be successful, you get 1,100 1, uh, thousand people. So I, I guess I'm there. I see, there you go. That's right. Engaged. 
Yeah. You know, and, uh, I, I, I do want to make another comment about that because I, I just kind of thought about this. Um, Seth Godin was talking about this 25 years ago. I mean, this is this whole influencer thing we have now. Uh, he's been taught. That's really what he was talking about. He was talking about and I don't, I don't even want to use the word anymore because it's so overused. Uh, he was talking about becoming an influencer. Having enough good material that a thousand people would follow you enough that you could build a, um, a, a a business out of that. What's happened now, which is pretty outrageous, I I follow this kind of stuff. I can find 14-year-olds that have 2 million followers. They make almost nothing. <laughs> almost nothing. You, you can have a half a million followers on six different platforms and you'll make about $40 a month in revenue from it if you don't know how to monetize it. So a lot of these people, even yeah. really young kids with TikTok and all these other platforms, have figured out a way to get followers, but they, they just don't have a clue how to monetize it. Yeah, that's that's the trick. I'm I'm trying to work that out. I'm not I'm I'm not going to get it from uh, social media, but I would like to uh, monetize my uh, my system. You know, yeah, he, but, uh, he, here here's part of the people, problem. You, you know, you you have these. You know, like I say, a, a 15 year old girl who has a million followers on TikTok because she does makeup videos. Well. I, you know, unless she can get some sort of a deal with some sort of makeup brand, um, you know, there's 10,000 other girls out there doing makeup videos. I mean, it, it's it's crazy economy we've built that somebody, somebody's making money off of her million followers, but it's not her. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, she should get. I don't, uh, think, I don't uh, think I have much competition for what I'm doing aerodynamically. <laughs> if there is, I haven't, I haven't seen it. Now, when you look at the video, you can see it's pretty dirty under there. I, I didn't wash it up, you know, but I, I leave the dirt on so you can see what's happening. And r right at the back, the, uh, the wakeboard on the back of the tractor, you can see where grease has hit it and, you know, from, from the drive line and that, and you, you can see it's nice, what the air is doing it's it do, you know it's nice streaks going the right way and uh, um, you look on the underside of the the trailer I've got the cross member covers on there and it's what is all this oil looking stuff all over it well I sprayed a fluid foam on it first and you know before I put the panels on and with the panels on there the fluid film stays there forever never get washed off and it creeps everywhere you know it creeps out the side of the the, uh, the trailer a little bit you know and uh so you know you might have to rub that off once in a while if that sort of thing uh goes against your sensibilities but the trailer will last forever you know i mean nothing's gonna <laughs> rust under there it right. soaks into the wood right. the wood will last <laughs> you know it, it's uh the Everybody wants to, what's the return on investment? They want it to pay. Well, you know, the cross member covers, that's going to take a while, you know, but that trailer will last forever, you know, and, uh, you know, towards the back of the trailer, having a smooth uh, underside of the trailer really makes a difference, you know, but uh, uh, can I tell you exactly how much it is? No, I, I, I'm not going to go there. Everybody, well, what does that say? What is, you know, I've got <laughs> 15, 20 different things and it all depends Here, upon how heavy you are, which way the wind know, is blowing, but you look at my fuel gauges and it works, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've been dealing with that forever. You need to prove how much that did and that did. Well, you can't always prove that. I don't care how much testing you do. But here's what we can prove. The, f the industry average for fuel economy in trucks still has not gotten out of the sixes. That is still the industry average. I think we're finally into the high sixes. We haven't hit seven yet as an industry average. Why then do we have people That's like pathetic. you? getting 10, 11, you know, 12 sometimes we're, we're even looking at now and lots of people doing it now. How? If nothing works when it comes to fuel economy, then why do we have trucks that get five miles to the gallon? We have trucks that get 10 miles to the gallon. Of course, things work. They're just hard to figure out. Yeah. It's not easy. 
they pass, they're passing me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, yesterday morning, I woke. I, I, I put eight hours. I split my sleeper berth. I, I knew I was going to pick up some uh, uh, hours after my eight hour in the sleeper berth. Well, I had 147 miles to go, and I only picked up two and a uh, two and a quarter hours. And I'm like, oh, am I going to stay here for two hours? They wanted it by eight. I said, ah, I'm just going to go for it. So I drove, you know, 72, 75. I still, it's just a little under 11, you know. So, I mean, I didn't like it. But, you know, I, I only had a 2,500-pound load on, but it's yeah. still going that fast, you know. Yeah. Um, and and Steve, so, Steve, don't you love when you post that kind of stuff on social media and somebody will always jump in and say, oh. I could get 11 if I only had 2,500 pounds. And I say, bullshit. No, you can't. You can't. I promise you, you're not going to do it. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I remember how hard it was to get to nine and how happy. And I remember when Henry Albert got nine and this is, he wasn't really on Facebook. It was, you know, um, I forget what media was in. And people read, oh, he, of course, because he's light and this and that, right. you know. And I <laughs> guess it's specs, you know. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I, and um, it, it, it takes a lot. You know, I have people, well, I I get a, I got 11 out of my water. Okay, maybe one time you did, you know, but you didn't do it all the time. I uh, Right now I'm up to... Uh, I, I think it's seven years, uh, you know, because of the rolling average uh, over seven years at over 10 miles a gallon. Which is incredible. Uh, uh, incredible. I mean, what an accomplishment that, what, that is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you'd, ha- you'd have to do some sort of uh, average fuel price over those years, which they, they've obviously fluctuated. Right. But, right. Uh, it's, it's yeah. right on there. Huh? I, I tell you, but I'm sitting in my car or my uh, pickup truck here, not my office, so I couldn't. I can't it, bring. Well, up my here's, fuel I, I, I can give you a really conservative, really conservative estimate as to how much it is. Uh, if we take the industry average high sixes or so, and we compare it to yours right. over that last seven year period, and we go pull an average fuel price, conservatively, it's going to be twenty five thousand dollars a year in profit. Conservatively, yeah. a year. Yeah. Right. So, so that's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yes. Yes. It, it, you know what? Let's think about it another way too. Let's really put it into perspective. That two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, that quarter of a million dollars, is either going going into Steve's pocket, or it's going into the oil company's pocket. That's it. That's that's what this whole story is. You want to give it to the oil companies, or do you want to keep it yourself? Yeah. Uh, now a lot of the, the a lot of the stuff, you know, people they they want it paid for in a year, you know, six months or whatever. But you know what? The aerodynamics. Once you own it, you own it. It. You know, um, and 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 it keeps saving you money and. Uh, Early on, I, everything I did, uh, did paid for itself. Now with the shop and you know the, right. <laughs> what right. I'm doing now, right. it's, it's costing me some money. But you know, hopefully well, that, I can get a return on that. But that would be like me trying to say so that, that my garden actually saves me money on groceries. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's way more expensive. You I know, know. It, it, it's not even it, close. It, I have the world's worth anything at I, all. Yeah, I, I have the world's most expensive tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, but they're the, they're the world's healthiest. Yeah, that's true. So how did you, how did your bug wars go? I wanted to ask this the oh. other day that your bug wars did that did that work out? Oh man, I love that. I, I told I, someone at dinner about that last night. I have three different bug subscriptions now. I have bugs sent to me on a <laughs> on a subscription. They are amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, they are amazing. <laughs> I have cut back, you know, and I don't use chemicals, chemicals, but I do use some things that are completely natural, like neem oil. You can spray neem oil right on the food before you eat it and then just eat it. I mean, it's that safe. Right. But it does help with, with some bugs and some other things. But if I don't have to use neem oil, I'd rather not. It, 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 you know, I'd just rather not have to put that on there. And I have eliminated almost all of that stuff. I have bugs doing all the work now. 
That's 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 incredible. I love that. It, it uh, I have had a my my shop here is in a little valley and kind of we're a little town, but sort of rural. And I just have mice, right? And uh, this spring, a big old black snake started turning up out back. I'd oh, see every yeah. now and then. And I've not I've not seen a mouse <laughs> turd since the black snake turned up. There you go. There you go. So but, and then the black I'm fine with him. He, he's he's awesome. He's about a, about a four or five footer. He's a little little chubby. And, you know, just hangs out out back. I'll open the garage door sometime, and they'll be hanging out, sunning themselves out there somewhere. And yeah, I'm like, all right. So yeah. I don't have mice so, anymore, though. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, I, I tried several different things in the beginning of the year. And the best by far, the most effective are ladybugs. Holy cow, when you have anything like aphids or the ladybugs are just awesome. The problem with them is they're so good that once they clean up the problem, they leave because the, the food isn't there for them anymore. They wiped it all out. They were so successful. Now my plants are nice and healthy, but the bugs leave. So I actually have ladybugs shipped in every three weeks. There was another bug that works like ladybugs, just they're just, you won't get as many of them. So they're not quite as effective. They're called green lace wings. And in the instructions, you put out the eggs, and then the eggs hatch, and you get these green lace wings. But they said you'll probably never see them. You're probably not going to find them in your garden. But they don't go away. They won't leave. They'll hang around. Well, lately, I'm seeing them. I've never seen this bug before in my life. But I, as soon as I looked at it, I'm like, wait a minute. I think that's those green lace wing things. I put some eggs out. This is like three months ago, first time we talked about this. And now I'm actually finding them. They're, they're resident in the garden now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, I, just, as, just as long as you don't have the, uh, what is it, the oriental uh, ladybug or Japanese ladybugs. I imported them here in Wisconsin. The, the Midwest they eat aphids on uh, soybeans. And those damn things bite. You know, they look like ladybugs. <laughs> oh, isn't it? Look, are they cute? They're so cute, and then they start biting you. You know, and, yeah. They don't go away. They're still I, here. So I, that's not very ladylike. I, no, no. no. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> so Kevin, I was, I was talking. You. To, yeah. <laughs> I mentioned to Lisa, I was, I wanted to ask you what the return on investment was on, on uh, the, uh, the board that you're doing now, but <laughs> I guess that's nothing now that compared to the, the, um, the TV show you were, uh, oh, yeah. spending money on yeah. there. That's the, you know, the, 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 I, I, I actually bragged about this last a week or two ago when I first went and bought all the equipment. I said, you know, I used to have to have a $60,000 boat to pull me around in the water. So I got rid of that. I, and I'm excited. And I said, look, once, you know, I've got all my equipment. This isn't going to cost me anything anymore. I can walk right down to the river. And gosh, yeah, that's not working out so well yet. And And I've already <laughs> figured out that my four and a half meter wing is only good down to about a 20 knot wind. If I've got anything less than 20 knots, I'm going to struggle. It's going to be a tough day. So I need a bigger wing. You know, I probably need a six meter wing, but then we're going to have those 30 knot days where I'm going to need a three and a half meter wing. And then, of course, my board right now has an awful lot of lift, so I probably need a smaller board for those high wind days. And I've already replaced a foil once. I probably need two or three. So I can already see the money. It's not going to stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, uh, back, and back on the uh, uh, return on investment, one thing I, I said I don't really tell people what uh, – you're going to save on everything because there's so many things that go into it. One thing I can say for sure, when I bought this new trailer, I didn't pull it a lot without anything on, but it was just on the lot. It had tools on it. You know, it had the factory settings for uh, the wheel bearings, um, uh, the skirts, and that, that was it. And so I put all my stuff on Well, I pulled it a little bit, but... It, it was really easy work, the easiest you'll ever do. I mean, it was uh, really light one way, empty the other. I could only do eight and a half miles to the gallon. So with what I've done, I'm over 11 and a half. 
So that I can say is what it saved me. I'm pulling it with the same truck, didn't do anything to the truck. Well, yeah, I guess I took the fan off. But um, other than that, it's the same truck. So, um, so you're talking three miles to the gallon. You know, maybe you could do the math on that from eight and a half miles to the gallon to 11 and a half. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so. All right. We uh, we have more calls coming in. So, Steve, I'm going to cut you loose here. We're going to grab some calls. We're going to have to wrap this up here. Already. Um, well, it's what, been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, man. wait a minute. Oh, sorry. I just uh, I just dropped John. Uh, Steve, so <laughs> I'll say goodbye to you again, yep. and I'll drop the right line. This time we'll have to get John back. Um, I'm sure he'll, he's got the number. He can just dial in and connect himself. Um, let's go to Minnesota. John, welcome to the program. Hi, Kevin. Um, Steve brought up this in my mind about talking about the global warming and, you know, the, the uh, core of the earth being molten. I started thinking to a motor, we use oil. Yep, John, we got you back. I just hit redial for you. Oil. I'm back. All right. Yeah. Now, I figured out with our new system, because I used to hang up on people all the time on Sirius, and then we always had a hard time getting them back. But on our new system, as soon as I hung up on you, there's a button there to call back. So I just called you right back. Cool. Yeah. So go ahead, John. The other John. So in an engine, we use oil as a secondary coolant. Could... Us pumping the oil out of the earth have a little bit to do with the global warming? Probably. Taking it has to have something cool, to do with something. Cooling. You know, you, you can't take... Exactly. I, at this point, we have to be into billions and billions of gallons of crude we've pulled out of the planet, right? I, that can't not have an impact. Yeah. That has to have some impact, of course. Yep. But, but I don't think we're smart enough yeah. to know what that impact is. No. No, I, I don't mean, think it, so it, either. It, it, it could have a bit of an insulating effect, I imagine. I, I, yeah, oil's a pretty good insulator. Actually, right. I use it in electronics for insulation. Yeah. Transformers and mm-hmm. stuff. So that makes sense. Yeah, so that could, uh, could be, but just I, I can't see the amount that we pull out making much of a difference. But maybe that, that's, 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 that's definitely plausible. Well, and, and let's, so like let's, let's, let's think about yeah. this, too. I, you know, I, I don't want to fight the global warming thing because, like I said, I, I believe that the climate is changing and we should focus on it. But I, I just think we do so many things wrong about this and, and they ignore the evidence. We all know we can go back and see that in the 1970s, they claimed we had less than 20 years worth of oil left. How did they get that so wrong? That we can go back and look, right. there were serious claims that Florida was going to lose real estate. A long time ago, it was supposed to happen. And there's almost no evidence that the oceans are raising anywhere in the world. They, they said, you know, islands are going to disappear. I have a hard time trusting people that could get something that wrong, but still be so zealous about it. I, they're, they're wrong. It's, they can be yeah. proven wrong, and it doesn't even uh, slow them down. See. That could be happening in hundreds of years. I mean, not right. 20 years. I mean, that, right. was, that was alarmist. Yeah. It, you know, there, there, are, there is logical data that the polarized catfish shrinking. That's, that's for real. That's not, you know, it's, you look at the photos and satellite imaging and whatever, and you can see that that's going away. But is it adding that much water? And with the extra temperature we've got now, there has to be some evaporative effect to, to so, control the, the level of water in the, in, in the oceans as well. So is, is it balancing so, out maybe? I'm not sure. You know, we'll get to a point where we lose more than evaporates off and we do start losing some coastline, maybe in 200 years or something. Right. Uh, you know, so. I, yeah, I'm not going to argue uh, what yeah. might happen in 200 years. I'm yeah. not going to ha- argue what might happen right. in 50 because we are really, really bad at predicting this stuff is my point. Well, it's it's yeah. a be afraid, be very afraid thing, right? So, 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 so there's a tiny bit of truth in it. There is truth right. in it. There is actually yeah. happening. And rather than you know be alarmist about it now, no, we've got hundreds of years to work on this. Don't need no, you know, we don't need to to to, to go crazy at the moment. This is what it boils down to. But they, 
you know, the researchers want to take advantage of that and they want to justify their case and they want to, you know, get more funding. And so be afraid, be very afraid. And yeah. hopefully someone will donate to our cause and we'll get to keep working. <laughs> and, you know, and it's not to say the stuff they're not finding is true. You must yeah. like the food. No, thing, I believe right? it. I, I do believe it. I, I, yeah, my well, whole point is I, yeah. I, we, we keep doing things before we really know what we're doing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, I just thought that was a theory that I figured I'd bring up. I've been kind of holding that in the back of my head for a while. And that's, that uh, is very plausible. It, it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's probably just a small bit, but it's, you know, we got the big picture we got to look at too. So, yep. Um, I mean, I, I, I really miss winter where I live. We had really fun winters here in Pittsburgh when I was a kid. I mean, we had, you know, it would snow in late November, early December. I'd have a sled riding track in my dad's yard. So I had a slight hill on it with a big old jump in it. And it would be April or May before that thing melted, where yeah. we worked it in, you know, that, that, right. that trail. Yeah. It was there all winter. My kids don't, For, we, they, they don't sled ride. We have a hill in our yard. It's, they, it's, I don't remember the last time the sleds were out. It just doesn't gr- happen. Growing so, up in, yep. in Northeast Ohio, an hour away from where you were, I had a snowmobile growing up. You'd be insane to own a snowmobile in Ohio now. What a waste of money, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I got to use it a lot. I, I used it a lot because there was <laughs> yeah. snow on the ground most of the winter in Northeast Ohio. I lived in the snow belt, but it's not like that anymore. I don't even know why we call it the snow belt anymore. <laughs> uh, you had that nice lake effect snow. The water we there did, right. come, come across yeah. area and, and, and dump on you. Yeah, yeah so our, too. our yeah. best or worst, depending on how you looked at it, snowstorms were always early in the year and late in the year when the the lake had melted. Once the lake froze, you lost the lake effect snow. It, it, it just didn't come anymore because it was the warm water that created it. Once it freezes over, that stops. So your worst storms, I always remember, were either really early in the season or really late in the season, like April. Yep. All right. Yeah, I like those late, those late snows were always great. Yep. All right. I might have to get to work. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, do have to, I do have to get to yeah. work. We're going to wrap this up today. Uh, you're, not, you're not getting to work. You're, you're, head, you're heading to the river. You're, I, you're out of there. I, I know, know what I, you're up to. Well, let, let me, I, I'll tell you in one second, because I haven't read. I'm going to read the wind forecast right now, and I'll tell you. Friday, windy today. Cool, calm, and potentially showery this weekend. So it sounds like I'm not going to be going this weekend. What do we got? Get it in now. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, The place that I go, right now, wind speeds are 20 to 23 knots. In in about an hour, they're going to be 24 to 27 knots all the way till dusk. Oh, I'm going to be on the river. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to set a goal today, and we'll have to update it on, on Monday. Here's my goal today. By the end of today, I'm moving my ass out of Beginner's Bay, and I'm going to be out on the Big River. <laughs> All right. That's my goal today. I can't today. wait to hear about it. Yeah, that's my goal today. All right, we will wrap this up. And we'll see you back here on Monday. Everybody have a great weekend. John, thanks as always. Great stuff today. We'll do it again next week. Good time. Yep. All right. Be All safe. Right. We'll see you next week. Be profitable. Right. Be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.